the second 2021. All managers are present. Um, is there any member of the public who wishes to speak to the board? No, no one there. Um, then we'll move to approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Move approval. Second by Maxwell. Thank you. Um, those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? On the consent agenda this evening, we have the approval of the July 8th board minute meeting, meeting minutes and approval of the check registers. We have a general checking account register, surety checking account, and the wire transfers. There are also two resolutions. Um, 21-048 is uh, approving the C or accepting the CAC bylaws, and resolution 21-049 is authorization to enter into a local trail connection agreement with Three Rivers Park District for the Six Mile Marsh Prairie Trail. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move approval. Thank you, Manager Miller. Is there a second? Hijmati, second. Thank you, Manager Hijmati. Um, those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? My report will be very brief. There was a, um, what was uh, billed as the uh, MOD summer event today, no summer tour, but there was a, a presentation in the afternoon. And two kind of reminders that would bring forward from that is, one is that uh, resolutions are um, being sought at right now. <clears throat> and there is one expiring that we had proposed a number of years ago. It's the um, uh, tax uh, recognition for uh, easements. Uh, conservation easement deduction of lowering the property tax, I think is what it was. If we wanted that to go back, we'd have to reintroduce it. The other um, ask was that if we had any thoughts for the strategic planning committee, they're coming up with their next anniversary is in 2022. And so it's the question is kind of like, is there something you'd like Mont to do or do differently? And that is my report. Um, I will look to you, Manager Miller, for the policy and planning committee meeting report. We had a a very uh, complete uh, presentation of of the uh, uh, consultant's uh, examination of the proposed uh, development on 325 Blake Road, and uh, the uh, it was a summary of the uh, two workshops or two day workshop uh, that was conducted earlier uh, or last week. And uh, kind of confirming uh, the feasibility of uh, of the built part of the of the project versus the natural part of the project, and the, whether we <coughs> can separate them and and still be feasible if they both come together. And it was a very uh, uh, good uh, presentation of the uh, of the summary of the of the two days and. Uh, I, I really want to publicly commend the staff for the tremendous work that quality of the work that was done on this and the leadership they provided the, our consultants to be able to produce this, uh, the quality of the work that they did. Thank you. Um, Manager Sando, Citizens Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I joined by Zoom with the Citizen Advisory Council on July 14th. <coughs> And the July CAC covered two items, bylaws and the 2022 budget. Uh, they received the bylaws that were updated and aligned with the board's recent adoption and recommendations coming out of the assessment of the CAC. Kim Lubu noted she had worked with the executive team of the CAC and the legal counsel to prepare the bylaws. And they were approved unanimously uh, the CAC uh, received a presentation from Mr. Whisker on the 2022 budget and asked a series of very good probing questions that showed a good level of engagement. And they offered some guidelines to the staff on refining the work plan publication. It was interesting, the suggestions uh, were that may, may have been too wordy and need some refining. And uh, we're, we're going to go back. To, excuse me. I, Not me. <laughs> Everyone slaps their pockets. I learned everybody's that, ringtones. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's too clever for me. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me. So that, that's the presentation ending that way. But it just was interesting, uh, the feedback that we got, and we're going to work on that, the wordiness of it, and then refine it. 
Thank you. Thank you, Manager Sando. Madam President. Yes. If I could just go back. I know Manager Miller was exuberant with his uh, recount of the 325 Blake discussion. Mm -hmm. But for our minutes, we also want to reflect that the Policy and Planning Committee also had half of a presentation about the Six Mile Marsh Trail interpretation. Thank you. Certainly. Thank Are you. Are we going to add that to the agenda as well? The other half? Oh, we're not going to. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. We just uh, under the Was that the introduction to the discussion? Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a short approved the agreement with Three Rivers. I didn't think it was worthy of a, of a uh, re report because it wasn't complete and we hadn't concluded that we were supporting We'll look supporting forward to the completion of the report right. yeah. at a subsequent meeting. Yeah, we talked about August 12th. We have a lighter agenda and we won't miss anything on schedule. And staff looked in through Minutris to City Council, so that's when you can expect it to come back. And it's so interesting. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, that's a really good project. Um, Manager Maxwell, Metro Mod. Metro Mod was the last Tuesday. The, the today they had another meeting today. The summer summer meeting was October, uh, July 22nd. Uh, the annual meeting is December, November 30th to December 4th. And the rest were just basically updates and presentations by different agencies. Some were there, some were not. Thank you. Um, the upcoming meeting and event schedule is in our agenda. The next time we gather will be on Monday. Um, and that might be uh, 5 o'clock for a walk around the park and 5.30 for dinner. So it says 6 for the meeting, but we may be gathering a little earlier than that. Um, <laughs> item 11.1, .1, resolution 21050. Uh, Mr. Dietrich is here to talk about the permitting program alignment. Am I doing this right? I kind of forget how to do it. Who's <laughs> <laughs> uh, this evening? guy now? I haven't seen him for a long time. Don't well, recognize first of all, it's great to see everybody in person. <laughs> I think it's been uh, over a year and a half since I've seen everybody in the same room. Um, but President White, uh, managers before the board this evening for action is item 11.1, .1, and that's authorization to approve a contract amendment uh, for permitting of program alignments, engineering services. Um, so I'll just be briefly summarizing a few key points here um, and then moving towards staff recommendation. Um, I do have a few slides pulled together uh, in the event that there are questions, but I had just planned on providing a verbal briefing this evening uh, before moving to staff's request. Um, so in September of 2019, the board approved the contract for engineering and legal services in support of uh, permitting's program alignment. Um, and the amount of that engineering contract was $19,674.50. Uh, so since that time, uh, staff in conjunction with Stantec, um, at the time it was Wank Associates, has been working to uh, complete the contracted items. Um, but however, as we all know, with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and remote work, um, there was increased coordination costs and there was additional meetings that were required in order to accomplish the, the initial work that, that we had scoped out. And those meetings were unscoped and unanticipated. Um, so staff is also uh, pursuing some additional wetland buffer analysis. Um, and that's kind of based on the board's feedback from the June 10th, uh, 2021 meeting um, where the results of the rule analysis were, um, were discussed. So uh, to complete the remaining contract work um, and the additional wetland analysis, uh, Stantec has provided a quote of $9,310, um, and staff has added a 10% of contingency to cover any additional meeting needs, um, and the total amount will come to $10,241. Um, so for subtracting the remaining contract funds that are uh, currently available, um, the amount um, that we'll need to complete the remaining work is $7,863.10. Um, and staff is recommending a contract amendment in that amount to complete the remaining work. Um, so I'll just note that the, the contract amendment can be accommodated with the overall project budget and we'll leave uh, sufficient funds to complete um, our remaining legal and contract work uh, as well, uh, contract services work as well. Um, and with that, uh, staff is recommending approval of the request to authorize the district administrator to execute an amendment to the Waste Wank Associates Incorporated contract, um, which is now part of Stantec, in an amount not to exceed $7,863.10 uh, for our total contract value of $27,537.60. Thank that you. That will take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Dijek. I didn't need to cut you off. Um, is there a motion to adopt uh, 21050? So moved. Thank you, Manager Hajmati. Is there a second? Second. 
Thank you, Manager Miller. Are there any questions for Mr. Dietrich? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Resolution uh, 21052 is next. Um, this is an authorization to execute a contract for assessment for East Operating Wetland Monitoring and Feasibility Support. Mr. Beck. President White, Board of Managers, um, thank you. What I have before you today is author, uh, authorization to execute contract for um, well and assessment uh, in upstream of uh, East Auburn Lake for Stantec. Um, to give you a brief overview of the presentation, um, I'll be covering just in lake impairment uh, overview, so lake impairments in Wasserman and East Auburn Lake. Um, an overview of recent water, water quality improvements in Wasserman Lake and an overview of past inv uh, investigations of uh, East Auburn wetland. And lastly, just an overview of the scope of work and the action items. So for reference, um, the lakes that I'll be talking about today um, are East Auburn Lake and Wasserman Lake, which are both impaired for excess nutrients. Um, and the reason I'm talking about Wasserman Lake specifically is because it has um, had several projects over the past uh, years to improve water quality conditions, including the Wasserman Lake Preserve, Wasserman Internal Load Management, and Lake Town 9, 9 uh, Wetland Restoration. And if you put those uh, projects on a timeline with water quality conditions, uh, what you can see here is that um, in the samples that we've collected in recent years, uh, water quality conditions are actually meeting water quality standards um, for the first time based on the samples that we've collected this year. So that's, um, so that's right over here. So we're actually meeting water quality standards, which is really great news. Um, and so the question is, um, meeting water quality standards is really great for water or for Wasserman Lake, but what does that mean for downstream water bodies, which also might receive that benefit from better water quality being passed down? And so <clears throat> if you put the load reductions for East Auburn Lake, which is the next downstream lake um, that's impaired uh, from Wasserman, this is the 534 pounds of load reduction. So each box represents five pounds. And so that's the amount of phosphorus that you need to reduce in East Auburn Lake to um, meet water quality standards. And so if you just look at the upstream lake contributions to that water quality reduction or that phosphorus reduction, you actually put a pretty big dent in just the East Auburn goal of um, that 534 pounds. So just improving Wasserman Lake actually helps us downstream East Auburn Lake, which is, which is awesome news. So if you say, okay, we have Wasserman Lake, then East Auburn, what's in between those two lakes, which is the, uh, what I am calling the East Auburn wetland. And it's actually identified as a potential project mm -hmm. in the watershed management plan um, as a potential nutrient reduction project or, or vegetation restoration. So um, what, we did, what staff did was look at historical data at um, what water quality concentrations are upstream and downstream of the wetland. So we collected data, um, it's at that southern point of the wetland, which is the inlet, and the most northern point of the wetland, which is the outlet. So um, it flows from south to north. And what we saw was concentrations went up um, dramatically in the wetland, and it contributes about 135 pounds of phosphorus to East Auburn Lake. So this wetland actually isn't improving water quality, it's degrading water quality. So that's a good thing to know to figure out, okay, how do we get East Auburn Lake to meet water quality standards? And so if we put that 135 pounds on that same graph of what do we need to do to have East Auburn Lake meet water quality standards, <coughs> that 135 pounds actually puts us pretty close to that total goal of 534 pounds. So it's pretty quickly getting us closer to the goal for East Auburn Lake, which is great news that we can just improve water quality in the, uh, in the upstream lake and this one wetland restoration can get us pretty far, potentially. <clears throat> so we know that it's a problem. We know that it could uh, go a long ways to improve East Auburn Lake, but we wanted to continue to refine, refining 
figuring out where exactly in the wetland is causing that problem. It might be the whole wetland or it might just be one small area. And so what we did was monitor four locations along the, the wetland. And what we identified was this small um, cell right here is actually contributing 82% of the total phosphorus coming out of that wetland. So the smallest part of the wetland is causing the greatest amount of export of phosphorus, which is good news from a restoration standpoint because it makes the restoration area much smaller, which would reduce the total cost instead of trying to restore the whole wetland. And so um, we've done a good job of identifying the problem, um, but I think the ultimate goal is to identify what the engineering solution might look like and so uh, staff developed a monitoring plan moving forward that's focused on um, supporting engineering design, but um, we are not engineers, so we, want, we worked with the, de uh, the district engineer who reviewed that sampling plan, um, provided uh, um, input on it, and also provided a scope to support what we were doing to ensure that the data that we were collecting um, is supporting future design work and that we're not missing things that would be really critical for the future design. Um, of uh, restoration in this area. In addition, there is a small amount that's um, dedicated to assessing if a project is possible, but not necessarily going far in engineering design. Just saying, okay, we know there's a problem, and a project is possible. These are generally what those might look like. The project cost is $48,550, um, which includes things like doing soil borings, putting in uh, wells, and supporting the, um, the actual assessment because there's a lot of expertise that we don't have, which includes like, having the equipment to do uh, drilling, drill rig, um, putting in wetland wells in addition to um, hydrogeology and um, hydro or wetland hydrology assessments. And so the first task, uh, it's important to note, is filling an important data cap, which is um, soil borings to identify where the phosphorus vertically is coming from in the wetland. And that's going to inform and will reduce the scope, the overall cost of the project, um, because right now we have it uh, extensively assessing everywhere, but that will limit the number of assessment areas within the wetland um, to ensure that when we actually put out the wells and do the monitoring that we're only looking at the areas that are actually um, critical to the project. So with that, um, uh, I'm requesting an authorization to approve contract with Stantec to conduct preliminary field visits, develop a, and execute a monitoring plan, and conduct a uh, feasibility level engineering uh, design for the East Auburn wetland for an amount not to exceed $48,550. Thank you, Mr. Beck. <clears throat> Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Thank you, uh, Manager Olson. Is there a second? Hishmati, second. Thank you, Manager Hishmati. Are uh, any questions for Mr. Beck? Question. Yes. Go ahead. Manager um, <clears throat> I wanted to thank Mr. Beck for his memo. As always, it was easy to read for being technical. So I appreciate that. Um, my question is, we've identified the problem being that cell, that first cell, and in this phase we're going to go and find the solution. Is it odd that a wetland is doing the opposite of what it typically does? And do we need to know what the cause of the problem is, or is that irrelevant? Will it circle back and negate the solution, or is, the, is that irrelevant or useful to know? Do we know it, I guess? Yeah, Manager Lopsis, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so similar to a lake that has had historic phosphorus loading to it, um, it has, you know, this wetland has memory, and it remembers that it's bunch of phosphorus that has been loaded to it to by this impaired water body and so even though we've improved the upstream by water, Wasserman, the yeah, up, Wasserman okay. Lake and it's delivered there and the reason why it's in that first cell is because it's that first cell has received all of that and settled out all of that phosphorus and now it's okay. leaking out and so what we're really actually doing is Cleaning remediating up. a historic issue okay that so, makes sense yeah it shouldn't be a problem moving forward okay Thank you, Andrew Olson. Another feature is that it's almost a straight shot going through there. There's no meandering, so it doesn't take time. It just dumps right there. Um, got a quick question. If we, uh, Alan, treat a lake bottom, I don't think it's effective, correct me if I'm wrong, to Alan treat a creek bottom because of the moving water, 
Uh, actually, Brian's the Allen expert, but uh, Manager Olson, to treat the creek bottom, it might work, but to Brian's point, when you get into some of these situations, it's understanding where, where the actual phosphorus loading is coming from. So to Manager Loftus' point, what we're finding with wetlands, everyone thinks they're sinks for phosphorus, mm -hmm. and they're really, they're really not in trying to come up. It's, it's that transformation Brian brought of the dissolved uh, the particulate phosphorus settling up, but then over time, you said have dissolved phosphorus, and that's the law that we're trying to grab. To Brian's point, um, and we're seeing it, it's it's kind of, it's not only just wetlands, but you're seeing that we're evaluating the stormwater ponds as well. We thought the ponds were great, and then they fill up. Um, everything has a life expectancy, and it's just we gotta take care of it. So as we look at that, that there is the potential, but I think Brian's done a nice job of laying out. We're gonna identify where that is in the vertical column, and then we'll start to focus on what the actual solution is. Would it be winter time excavation of the soils and it, it all it, it all depends. Uh, okay. Typically, yeah, you try to go in in the winter months. Uh, but wetlands like to stay warm, so as much as you think they're frozen, sometimes they can be warm. So it would be something that we would evaluate. Okay. Uh, we're we're the best thing. Okay, because if you if you cross that flow. It, today it looks crystal clear. So it, you know, it's clearly it's dissolved phosphorus and it's running through there. But to, to the untrained eye, you'd think, wow, they really cleaned up this network. Well, it, take <laughs> 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 yeah, it's it's ironic that what looks so great is not so great. So thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Beck? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. <coughs> um, other staff, also, Ms. Brown and Ms. Demjanjic Lee, thank you. Okay. Moving next to Resolution 11053. This is a um, concurrence with the staff recommendation for project opportunities review through the pilot responsive program. Ms. Moran. Point three, uh, we're seeking concurrence with staff recommendations for opportunities evaluated through the pilot responsive program. And so district staff are requesting the board concurrence with staff's recommendation presented to the board on July 8th at the operations program um, committee. So these recommendations are consistent with the proposed uh, responsive program implementation guidance <coughs> that the board will also be discussing next under discussion item 12.1. And just for a quick background, um, on July 8th at OPC meeting, uh, staff reviewed uh, project background, staff evaluation findings, and then also the staff recommendations for these three um, opportunities. <coughs> so the first one was a private brewery located in Spring Park, so it's that Ring Garden project. Um, next, we looked at the city of Edina, the Morningside Flood Infrastructure Project, and in particular, we honed in on a um, project add-on, which is a water reuse um, in the Weber Park area. And then we also looked at the City of Plymouth, the Maple Creek Drainage Improvement Project as well. And so um, under this pilot phase for the responsive program, staff have been evaluating partnership requests following uh, these four criteria categories. So right, we have our resource need and priority. So we have the alignment of the resource needs and the priorities identified in the district's plan, um, but also through ongoing monitoring and diagnostic efforts. Then our second one is project benefits. So these are the estimated benefits across the district's goals of water quality, quantity, ecological integrity, and thriving communities. And then cost effectiveness. So we're looking at the cost effectiveness compared to alternatives or to other past or current um, um, project opportunities. And then that last piece is the partnership and coordination. So we're looking at the strength of the partner's coordination, integration of the district goals, and then also the willingness to really commit resources to advance an opportunity. So staff evaluate these opportunities by applying these four criteria categories and rank them and then vet them through a cross-departmental uh, staff team to inform our response. And so for these three opportunities that we reviewed on July 8th, uh, first we actually started on the western portion of the watershed, so it's that uh, back channel brewery, uh, Rain Garden, and with that project I'll just kind of 
briefly recap all of these, but I have additional slides if we have any questions. So for that one, it's a private rain garden on commercial property. We're looking at a project benefit around 2.3 pounds of TP removal um, each year. Um, it does not flow into, it flows into Seaton Lake, which is not impaired for nutrients. Um, then we next looked at the Dino Morningside Flood Infrastructure Project. And so the city has already approved their $10 million, pro $10 million project for this. And that's really just re, you know, re, um, upsizing pipes, you know, um, expanding their network, expanding storage capacity. There's um, expanding Weber Pond for a predictive pumping piece. So they're really trying to address local drainage issues for that project. Um, and then they've added on this project element um, that would only occur for the district funded it, and it's a water re re system. And so for that project on the high end, we'd be looking at 10 pounds of TP removal every year. And then that last project we looked on, I uh, looked at on July 8th, was in the city of Plymouth. It was the Maple Creek project. And so this project in Maple Creek would flow down into Plymouth Lake, which is impaired for nutrients. <clears throat> Post project at kind of the initial uh, cost estimate and project benefits was looking at 41 pounds of TP removal um, each year over a 20 year life cycle. And then the cost effectiveness actually was, was, came out quite strong at eight, uh, $800. Um, per pound of TP removal over a 20 year life cycle. And so with that, um, I'm trying to be quick on this one. So staff is seeking board concurrence on the staff recommendations for these three. So for the private brewery located in Spring Park, we're uh, requesting um, the concurrence on our recommendation to decline funding. Um, for the city and Dinah, the Morningside Flood Infrastructure Project, um, you know, we are in support of this project and we really view Dinah as a leader in climate change impact projects. Um, and we're actually working with them on a pilot program or developing a pilot program for a, a, a 2D model. Um, and then we're still requesting though um, to decline funding for this project add-on element uh, for the reuse system at Weber Park Pond. And then for the city of Plymouth with the Maple Creek drainage improvement, um, the request or the staff recommendation for concurrence is to proceed with um, the consideration of the opportunity. And here we're really looking to request additional information from the city so we can actually further assess the feasibility and the cost effectiveness of the proposed project. We would plan on coming back to the board with a recommendation, uh, likely in September, um, with a recommendation at that time. So again, we're just seeking concurrence on what we had talked about on July 8th um, with the resolution 21053. Thank you, Ms. Moran. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution? Move approval. Thank Second. you, Manager Miller. Seconded by Manager Olson. Any questions for her? Those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And as you said, the next item is also uh, yours and Ms. Christopher's responsive program. I actually think this is my first time presenting, so. <laughs> is there? Right? Yes. <laughs> All right, so now moving on to discussion item uh, 12.1. Uh, so this is the responsive program implementation guidance. And so in your board packet, um, we included the memo which out outlines the background and the key program decisions um, where we're really looking for board input tonight on kind of these decisions, do we go right or do we go left, right? So we're really focusing on these key decisions um, and you can follow along as we walk through this in the presentation. They're the same ones that were outlined in your memo. Um, in addition, in your packet, you had two attachments. The first one was a draft responsive program implementation guidance. Um, and then the second is a draft criteria evaluation form as well. And so tonight we're really hoping to kind of walk through these decision points and really hear from the board um, regarding um, you know, the proposed recommendations. And so just kind of where we're at, currently we are in a pilot phase, which will be continuing along here in the process. Um, but this is kind of the first round for board input. Um, so tonight we'll cover these kind of these eight key recommendations. Um, we plan on coming back to the board at least once with kind of additional discussion items for these program decision points um, and also kind of re reflect back what we've been hearing from the board. And then in September we will be seeking um, board authorization to initiate our stakeholder engagement process. And as part of that is actually forming our technical advisory committee, so our TAC. And so the TAC will also be then reviewing and vetting this program along with um, the permitting alignment work um, that you've been hearing from Tom as well. And then ultimately in um, the TAC will run from you know, Q4 to probably Q1. And so we're looking for board adoption 
in early 2022 for the program. And so that attachment one in your memo, that draft responsive program implementation guidance is ultimately what you would be adopting in early 2022. Currently, you're just seeing the draft form with the, addition, with the current recommendations. And so I will be fairly brief um, in terms of a background discussion for us and so we can jump right in to the responsive program and I'll kind of ground us with the purpose and goals. And from there, we're gonna go into these eight key program decisions. Um, I will focus first on scope and structure and there's kind of three decisions there and this is kind of the heart of the program. Um, so I wanna make sure we kind of walk through all of these. I'll kind of stop for clarifying questions and then I have a break for us to kind of have a discussion. Next, we'll move into schedule and process, and then we'll kind of work through those remaining five items. And that's more kind of the authorization, authorization I can't talk in front of you today, <laughs> um, for the program um, and supporting this program as well. And then we'll wrap up with next steps. So we have quite a lot to uh, cover here. So. so in terms of background, we know the district is focused on the protection and improvement of natural resources. Um, you know, land use is the primary driver of health of the natural resources, and this, of course, was brought into our balanced urban ecology, the e policy, back in 2014, uh, which recognized, right, the district delivers maximum value to its taxpayers by integrating um, its work into land use. And by doing this, then we can achieve not only the district goals, but then we can also hit on these broader social and economic objectives as well. And so the BUE policy rippled through the organization and was also those principles were incorporated into the 2017 Watershed Management Plan. And to really focus in on bridging this land use water planning gap, um, two approaches came out of this. So first is focusing on areas of high need. So that's currently going um, on in the Minnehaha Creek Subwatershed and in Six Mile. And we also have to remain responsive to these needs and opportunities. And so with that, the district recognized the need for a thoughtful approach for responding to opportunities across the watershed. And so we're basically trying to marry up the local geography uh, with this responsive program. So that's really gonna allow us to maximize our effectiveness as a water resource agency. And so to ensure the district is in a position to capitalize on opportunities throughout the watershed, um, the district being, began to develop a formal program that kind of had three key components. And so the first was identification, right? So how are we gonna actually identify these opportunities? evaluation, um, how will we determine which opportunities to actually pursue, and then response, how do we actually commit the resources to those opportunities it chooses to do so. And I do just wanna pause here, um, A, to catch my breath and slow down, sorry. And then also for, um, we, you know, we've been calling this the responsive model, and you'll see from going on, I'll be calling it the responsive program. And so um, in 2019, um, the purpose goals and the high level structure that I just referenced, right, identification, evaluation, and response, was vetted through the CAC and the committee. And so this work really framed the purpose of the responsive program. And so, right, we're trying to provide support for public and private projects that are well coordinated and also aligned with the district's goals and priorities. And so the intent under this program really is to achieve four goals. So our first one is to improve water resources. And we're going to do that through, right, achieve significant measurable progress towards the district goals by capitalizing opportunities created through land use change. Our next one is um, improve integration and early coordination with land use planning. So promote and incentivize closing that gap, right, between land use and water planning and establishing very clear pathways and an orderly process for early coordination, right? So we're trying to reduce those barriers. Um, and then the third goal here is to provide service and value to our communities. And so that allows us to you know, remain responsive to these needs outside of our focal areas by providing support to partner-led projects that address water resource needs and priorities <laughs> for the district. And then our fourth goal, uh, last but not least, is maintain focus and flexibility. So right, we have to operate a program in a way that supports the district's principles to focus and flexibility. And we're gonna do that by maintaining focus on high impact projects while ensuring the flexibility to really create and develop these creative partnerships. And so with that, tonight we'll be walking through these kind of eight key program decisions. As I mentioned earlier, kind of the heart of the program is the scope and structure. So I'll walk through each of these, the scope, um, the connection to the plan and district services. I'll briefly pause after each one for clarifying questions. And then I have some discussion questions for us to kind of dive in to kind of see um, you know, where the board's at. From there, we'll go into the schedule and process. 
And while um, I'm going through these, I mean, here's just some kind of considerations to keep in mind. Um, is the board comfortable with the recommendations? Do they align with your expectations for the program? What are the board's questions or concerns? Um, what areas need further discussion or more information? And then what opportunities and challenges does the board actually anticipate with this proposed program? And so for our first one, um, what is the scope of activities and the partners that the district is looking to identify and support through this program? And so some of the considerations are, you know, do we want a broad or a focused scope of activities? What can we learn from past lessons uh, learned? So right, how can we integrate that and that institutional knowledge and bring this into this program? What are the type and scales of land use change that we actually want to leverage with the scope? And then what is the uh, alignment with the district goals and priorities? And so the recommendation here, um, the program would develop, develop and implement capital projects um, that basically measurably improve water resources at a regional scale. And so the question for scope is, do we want this program to be really focused on capital projects or do we want a kind of a broader um, scale or scope? So we're including items such as like street sweeping um, or educational programs. And so in terms of the recommendation for the scope, we would be excluding um, these kind of pro programmatic or operational activities such as street sweeping. Um, so the district can really then, um, so then with that, then the district can still choose to consider a partnership requests for those type of activities, but it would just be outside of the scope of this program. So that's the scope piece. Now write eligibility. So for a uh, program recommendation, um, Right, we're trying to target projects at, a re with, at regional significance with partners that have the capacity to lead implementation. And so what this means is we're actually seeking partners who are significant players on, um, on land use, which means they will actually be, you know, kind of will be identifying through coordination with our municipal partners, our public partners, um, and through the review of private development under the permitting department. Um, so again, right, we're trying to find those people where we can get that target of regional significance with the partners that actually have the ability to lead and have the capacity to implement. Um, and so with this um, direction, this would also then move us away from these kind of small-scale BMPs and highly localized kind of private land issues. Um, so that would be the recommendation for both the scope and eligibility. So in terms of the rationale for this, um, the district has chosen a strategy at, of delivering high-impact projects as a way to accomplish its mission and has also aligned its programs to support project delivery. Um, so a focused program scope would improve effectiveness and efficiency by reducing overhead associated with evaluating and responding to requests that are not well aligned with the district goals. And this is something we saw through the pilot phase. Um, you know, if you kind of allow anything and everything to come in, how do you actually effectively and efficiently evaluate a turf program with a regional stormwater treatment pond to an eroded gully on private property to a public trail project to you know, a residential garden. And so by narrowing in and focusing that scope, we're um, you know, improving the effectiveness and efficiency, um, but then we're also improving the clarity and understanding to our prospective partners. And then um, the district has operated grant programs in the past for these smaller scale BMPs and also educational fo uh, focused programs. And those were evaluated and suspended through the strategic planning process based on the determination that they did not provide significant uh, return on investment or progress towards the district goals and priorities. And so lastly, um, I do want to note that, you know, the district is focused on really closing that land use water planning gap. And so really by focusing in on these key activities and these key players in land use, this uh, proposed scope and eligibility allows the district to really use this program as a way to, as to kind of target those right activities and then the right land use planners to really engage them early. And so I will pause there for any clarifying questions and to catch my breath. I have one quick one. Go ahead. Are most every request public or private? Oh, say one more thing. Well, are most of our requests public or private? Most are uh, public, um, but do we do have these coming in from the private side as well. And so with the proposed scope and eligibility, what we're trying to get at is we're trying to get these projects that have a regional benefit and we're not just targeting local projects. And um, then we're also working then with, you know, these, the private side, but they have the actual capacity then to implement. So this would shift us away um, from having a project coming from like a lake association. If they had partnered with the city, 
right, then they, we would be willing to entertain and work with them. Okay, that helps just know where we're coming from with that. Mm -hmm. Angela Loftus. Um, how would you let people know right away that if their project doesn't have regional significance, it's you know, it's not, this isn't the program for them? And so the way we've also set up the process, um, there's kind of this initial stage that allows us to kind of assess and see if there is a regional benefit. There's kind of that exploratory phase. But would you eventually have something where they could ask themselves that question before they even we, kept going further down the line? And then, you know, what does regional mean beyond a neighborhood, beyond a city, beyond, you know, how big is that? That's fair. Um, I think with this one, for the regional, I know we're also looking at providing guidance around that. Um, and also ultimately kind of looking to provide maps of kind of what our key areas are that we're looking for to help people kind of understand what yeah. we're trying to target. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And then um, I like changing the name from um, framework to program, but I wonder if the word responsive is kind of our lens versus the public lens, whether it should be like a partnership program or some other regional, you know, something that's a little more accurate of what you might be that is drawing your customer or whatever the right word is to be thinking about versus what we're doing is responding, but that isn't helpful for people to know what we're doing. The, the opportunist program. Put it in the so this not, this <laughs> suggestion not, box. It's not an email It's an I excellent am not question. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, it is definitely an excellent question. We actually have a running list okay. of potential names, and it is something um, we could um, bring forward here with to the board, but also I think it's something worth visiting and uh, <coughs> screening uh, with the TAC as well. Yeah, I'm sure there's plenty of people who can come and I think up with great names. And that names. is sort of one, one of the next steps is sort of figuring out the marketing materials to go with it, and that includes yeah. revisiting the Mm -hmm. so, sort of I appreciate you making it a program from a framework. And, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Did you have your hand up? No, I, I don't give him my hands are wet. Manager, here's mine. Yes. <clears throat> I'm wondering how we're going to incorporate um, letting the taxpayers who are funding us know that how they're going to benefit from what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's critical. That is an excellent question. Um, and there's a couple pieces to that. Um, one is, um, which I'll get to here in, later, um, in terms of the structure, we're going to be tying it to our um, capital improvement plan, which has a more robust and public transparency so people can see these projects as they're moving through. Um, in addition, we'll have um, the outreach material as well to promote what we've been doing and the benefits of those partnerships and these projects. Okay, so any other thoughts? It sounds, like this? That, it sounds like that's still there's a lot of DVD in the. I believe so. Yeah. Um, for this, in terms of right right now, we're just trying to lock in these key decisions um, as we kind of build out the program further. Um, and so I think that is one item where, you know, as the marketing materials become tighter and we kind of have these focused in what is our actual scope, you know, what is the connection, what is the heart of the program, then we can work on that piece. Anything else at this point? Mr. Whisker? Well, I would just answer Manager Hedgemati's question by saying that we'll let the taxpayers know about the effectiveness of the program the same way in which we're communicating the benefit of all of our investments. The way that the program's tracking, and that you'll hear from Kate and Becky tonight, is it's really the, re the reciprocal of our focal approach of delivering projects. So where we're focusing, we're the catalyst, we're leading, we're convening, we're investing in high-impact capital improvements. This is an opportunity for us to intake projects from our municipal partners or private developers through the permitting arm and make orderly capital project investments. So you can, in terms of communicating to the broader public the water quality or quantity benefits of the projects that we're selecting, you can think about um, the analog is how we're doing that organizationally through our outreach strategy for any kind of capital project. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
you can move on. Right. So um, our next item here is what is the foundation for the program in the watershed management plan and what are the associated procedural requirements um, for funding and then also the public process as well. And so to provide the district with flexibility to respond to project opportunities created through land use um, and through partner initiatives as well, the district built in two options into its plan. And so that first option is the capital improvement plan. And so that's where we're going to incorporate um, opportunity-based stormwater um, management projects into the district CIP for each sub-watershed. Um, so these allow the district then, after undertaking project ordering process, to contribute funding to a project that will make progress towards the volume and then load reduction goals identified in the plan. And then the second option is this incentive program. And so this is described in the plan as an opportunity grant program that allows the district to reestablish a grant program if it chooses to do so. Um, and as with the CIP approach, the district could require partners to come in early um, with the proposed projects to be evaluated and prioritized and then put onto a, um, basically a district project funding list. Um, so with this grant approach, um, it's currently set up uh, through um, through the district where it would also be routed through the Citizens Advisory Committee as well, the CAC. And so the recommendation um, is um, for this program is to go with option one, uh, funding project implementation via our CIP. Um, and so here's another kind of critical, do we go right, left decision point. Um, option one paired with the recommendation of kind of that focus scope uh, would allow the district to really focus in on these regional projects where the district has the space and time to really help shape projects on the land outside of our local areas. Um, versus option two with this grant program, right, it's a little bit more hands off. Um, so when we think of a traditional grant program, you think of someone has already kind of a, a fairly figured out project, they fill out an application, there's kind of a grading or rubric form, and then you get uh, funds um, handed out um, at the end. And so in terms of the rationale for this, um, the way we're kind of thinking about is option one with the CIP route, right? We're basically allowing us to help shape projects with partners with that avenue versus the option with the incentive program or this grant program, we're basically funding partner projects. And so um, in terms of project influence and control um, for that first option, Right, with that CIP route, we're going to have a more project influence. We're going to be working with the partner through development of the project, which ultimately will lead, uh, lead to higher quality control, right? You have just more touch points with that partner. Um, you're likely to have a higher quality um, product at the end. Versus option two, right, you have less, um, you know, project influence. So you're basically kind of up to whatever comes your way um, from your partner. So your quality control could really vary depending on your partner. Um, in terms of the relationship building with option one, right, again, that allows us to have kind of that time and space to basically work through and collaborate together um, on a project. Um, first, with option two, with this grant approach, right, there's just not a lot of touch points there. There's not a lot. It's more transactional. Um, and so you just have limited um, um, kind of touch points there. In terms of efficiency, um, option one is going to come with um, higher overhead just because staff will be working with these uh, partners to really work and, and understand shared goals and individual goals um, to build out a project. Um, so with that, you know, in terms of, you know, how fast a process moves, that's where the incentive program or the grant <coughs> program would be uh, more efficient, right? You would receive applications, you would grade them, and then you would decide to send, give out funds or not. In terms of flexibility, um, option one provides um, with the CIP, you have greater flexibility in a couple different ways. Um, <coughs> in terms of right, tying it to the process and right, how you would evaluate, um, you can have, you can be more flexible because you can help, you know, project in concept or in feasibility or implementation um, versus with the grant program, right, you just have a scorecard and you're looking at the project once and it's kind of snapshot. Um, also, in terms of flexibility with the CIP route, that's the backbone of the program, but it also doesn't limit you in terms of other ways to provide services um, and other ways to basically provide support for projects. Um, 
In terms of public transparency, uh, with option one, that one already naturally has a structure in there where we have a 30-day comment period for our CIP that goes out for project ordering or project implementation. There's a public hearing. So you're just going to have a more robust public tra transparency with that option. Versus the grant program, right, it would be routed through the CAC um, for in this instance. And so that is um, the connection and funding mechanism. And so the, the recommendation of going with the CIP route. Um, any clarifying questions? I have one. So if I'm a private developer, I come in, what's my trigger on time that I could probably get through this whole process? Because so they're, they're, they're going to be in a hurry. But we have to go through a process, and you're talking about the CAC. I was going through it. What kind of time frame? Mm -hmm. Um, that's an excellent question, and that's part of the flexibility um, that would be built in. Um, so we recognize with the process, we kind of have, you know, concept, feasibility, implementation, and we recognize we want to be nimble for those private developers. So we actually will decouple that from the CIP for these faster moving projects. And we'll talk about this um, in a couple other decisions down. We basically have strategic reserve funds that would be set aside for implementation and providing services on that rapid timeline. One of the ways in which um, the grant type program is not, um, there isn't that accountability is that we don't get a, a report at the end. I mean, when we had a grant program, we never heard what worked and what didn't. Um, so that's a strike against the option two. Mm -hmm. Angela, just. Um, I agree with your recommendation on the CIP. I think there's a bit of nuance in that benefit and pro and con list. Um, mm -hmm. I think we w getting involved in some of the feasibility somewhat marries us or gets us expectations up that we've approved the concept. We're investing in these feasibility services or figuring out this information with you as a partner. Um, you know, it's, it's not as concrete as a grant process, right? Then you're, without knowing the exact cost at concept, you're somewhat in a difficult position not to fund it. Should you not feel the results are, the feasibility is as high as you had hoped, or you didn't know the, con you know, the extent of the cost or whatnot. Um, so there's ambiguity in there that is a little riskier in my opinion, but I think Generally speaking, CIP funding for those projects makes the most sense. Thank you. Um, so Manager Loftus, I think with that one, we'll also touch on that um, in the process section. Okay. Because um, we also recognize that risk point as well. Um, it's one of those trade-offs. And the way we set up the process is, right, we have kind of a concept, we have a feasibility and implementation. Mm -hmm. um, We've actually recognized we have to build in expectation management with our partners. And we basically have uh, these off ramps where right after concept, we can have, you know, exit, you know, with feasibility, we can exit. Um, so we just have to make sure we're managing those expectations and we have the ability, right, to just because we funded a feasibility study does not mean that we would fund the implementation. <coughs> What is people's sense around option one, option two? Totally. <laughs> totally? Totally I'll, I'll do, I'll do one or two? <laughs> of it. Yeah, it, it, we, we have spent the last four years very carefully putting our budgets together. And w where you have a grant program, uh, let's say the state raises a pile of cash, you'll have Lassar and Sam's committee, the whole group, sit around and figure out how to give it away. That, that's, that's their job. And if you've got merit, they'll give you the money. And if you don't have merit, you don't get the money. But what we've done, literally in our zero-based budget approach, is that we justify every dime very clearly and very easy to understand ahead of time. And so it's not like we've got these buckets of money that we're struggling to give away. And so, in a sense, I see option two as contrary to the way we budget. And if it's worth doing, it's worth going into the CIP. So... And that, that's more compatible with the way we put our budgets together. Okay, Charleston. Other? 
Um, I wanted to just touch back on uh, Manager Maxwell's question. I think with regard to private project timelines, um, I think that is still a challenge. I mean, the way we've set this up, it would a project, a private project, would still need to go through the same steps of, um, you know, potentially being amended into our CIP, depending on whether or not it's already there's already a project there it can be tied to, um, which has you know a 30-day period associated with it. Um, it would still need to have a public hearing and it would still need to be ordered. Um, so I think the idea is for those, um, we would do that in as expedited of a fashion as we can, you know, trying to do that in a few months, you know, with the different board actions that are needed. Um, if the board feels it's worth, you know, kind of that push. Um, but I think, you know, there is still some process and timeline that we'll have to go through, but we, the difference is we wouldn't have to do it on sort of the set calendar of, you know, aligning it with the budget and, and the CIP process, we could draw from reserves to do it a little bit quicker. But there are still some steps involved, certainly. I think it would just be important to, to, to not give something false hope and then mm -hmm. get the money. But communicate with early enough, yes, you have a shot. Let's go, let's, let's go through the process because we think it's, it makes sense to do. Right. And instead of to look at the guy saying, yeah, you know, it's 50 50. You know. Right. Then you'll know that he should, you know, right. go find something else. So early in the process, we should kind of let him know. You know where we think, what direction we're going to go. Well, and there'll be a balance on what you require for submittals for that concept approval. Right. The and more and you require, the less people will apply, or the less information you get, the more you get pulled into a project that you don't intend to necessarily potentially fund. So it, it'll be a, a delicate what you decide to require for that concept approval. Is it simply a letter from the city supporting a certain project, or do they have to, you know, you put a worksheet together later, do they have to hit all those topics mm -hmm. and um, provide a narrative? Are they providing plans? I don't know, but... Um, yeah, and I think um, more often than not on those, you know, sort of private ones that we're maybe flagging through permitting, it's probably ones that we're identifying and kind of chasing and Um, versus trying to set up a very clear structure process more for our public partners to follow and try to help manage so that we're not scrambling on every single opportunity or, or the ones that should have enough lead time to be able to kind of follow those steps. Another quick comment that maybe yes. we should maybe we make sure we have enough documentation when we turn somebody down that, that we don't come back and somebody says, well, don't even apply for it, you'll never get it. What's, what was the reasons and everything else? Just, documentation to the why, why we accept somebody or turn them down is it would be important to uh, I, I want to I, I think we want to keep away from a grant program as far as we can mm -hmm. uh, and because uh, people think that there's a free money you know kind of approach whereas if uh, rather than advertise for it, go out and find somebody that's doing something and, and, and improve the, uh, the uh, reach of it or the quality of it or, or, or whatever. Uh, if someone is committed to it before they find out there's money available, I mean, is kind of my approach. I, I think, you've got to be careful how I state this, but for a change. Uh, but I think we, we wasted a lot of money with the grants before. Uh, you know, they, we were anxious to get rid of it, and we did a little bit of, of improvements along the shores of Lake Minnetonka and, and a couple of country clubs and stuff. And, and then the neighborhood groups, you know, two-thirds of them would drop out of the program before it got completed, but they still had the overhead of, Sponsoring the program and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's. Uh, I just think that we, we want to make sure that we got real partners that are, got a real need that uh, they're willing, they're, that we can contribute to not only funds but also our s staff and resources and, and stuff to make it better and, and imp more impactful than just granting out uh, money to something that may or may not make a big difference. Yeah, it should be merit based. Yeah. yeah. You know, if we don't fund anything in a year, that's fine. Mr. 
Mr. Whisker. I, well, I just wanted to pick up on the board's thread and say I think I'm really happy to hear you digging into the, the key issues. I think the one of the things that I wanted to point out is um, the, the direction to go on a capital improvement plan, from my mind, is all about the relationships and the experience that we're going to be having with the cities to develop projects of, of scale versus, you know, a, a, sort of a key tenet of the grant program is relatively easy, it's streamlined, it's hands-off, it's transactional. And we've made it our policy to develop really high-impact capital improvements that integrate land use and water. So then, since that's one of our policy objectives, this is a way to incentivize that because by setting these expectations, as Manager Loftus is keying into, at each milestone in project development, feasibility, design, construction, maintenance, what's our minimum threshold and how do you pass through those gates, we're effectively, through each experience, um, you know, training, coaching our cities on how to engage us in a meaningful way to get really high impact work done versus just doing things on a transactional basis. And I don't know that we wasted money. We made some good investments and they were done on uh, water quality um, metric, but um, they just didn't go through the right, the necessary filters to, to make sure that we're aggregating benefit in the areas that we that we wanted um, and I think what we prove more than anything through those grant programs is um, not having a hand in the project and, and helping you know own it and select it and, and develop it just handing out money didn't necessarily win us a ton of friends and that was one of the fundamental premises of the grant program so I think the relationships and working closely with communities on evaluating their projects is kind of at the heart of that approach in the CIP brings people closer. Now you have to decide, to Manager Loftus's point, what's the balance point? How f do you want to fund feasibility 50-50 on them all, or that it's the feasibility responsibility is the cities? And then how do you participate? You know, once you order the project in design and construction, historically, on all of our CIP, we have negotiated those terms at every single stage, which is very labor intensive, and that's the labor that we're dedicating in our focal program. So if this is supposed to be more streamlined, there's a real balance point here to strike where you're trying to get people to come in through feasibility, but if we're negotiating 60, 40, 30, 70 on feasibility, we're scoping it out, we're doing the RPs, we're going to be essentially developing the projects and that will pull our programmatic services away from projects where we're leading and, and we're catalyzing. So those are some of the points I want to make and maybe some of that's foreshadowing for a good transition. Yeah. when you get into the next, the next step. <laughs> You hit all my points. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, make them again. Yeah. Yeah. And then it'll stick the second yeah. time. Make yeah. it clearer this time. <laughs> <laughs> you will have heard it before. <laughs> I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, any other questions before we move on to district services here? Uh, I don't know if this is the right place to say this or not, um, but I was thinking as I went along about those sort of urgencies. People come in and say, this has to happen now. I've got a deadline. Um, you know, and asking myself where that fits in here. And so mostly, if they've got a deadline, it's not going to be within our um, mission, <laughs> I think, or our way of doing business. And so, I don't know, that's just, I didn't have an answer thoroughly, but I was thinking about those questions. The permitting um, option is an exception to that, of course. A great comment, President White, um, and I'll touch on that a little bit later as well. Um, but in terms of kind of providing that, the way we've structured these phases, um, I'm losing my train of thought as I talk to you about this now. Oh, no. I'll jump in. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I, I had a thought on yeah. it. Um, I think, um, yeah, I guess generally the way I think about it and with some of the ones we've been receiving lately that are sort of a little last minute in terms of being able to respond to them, um, I, I just think of it as sort of needing to meet a higher bar <laughs> um, to be worth pursuing it. Um, and I think we are trying to build in, you know, sort of the rationale to be able to say, or the justification to be able to say no to those because, you know, you didn't kind of meet our gates and follow our process, but still we want to be able to have the flexibility where if we really, if the board really sees the benefit and it's feasible for us to kind of scramble and hit the deadline that we can still do so. But yeah, I think it has to because kind of meet a higher bar in terms of the benefit to be worth doing that. And you can always say thank you and think of us next time you start your project. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. Thanks. 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 Thanks
Mm -hmm. And so with that, right, that is in our criteria and it's part of that coordination partnership piece. And again, it's to that training um, element as well. So maybe if they did come in late initially, right, it's a learning stepping stone. If you come in earlier next time, right? So again, it's trying to bridge that gap. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> All right, uh, district services. Um, unless we have any other kind of final questions here. Uh, district services. What is the range of services the district uh, should provide uh, to support the program's goals and intended outcomes? And so some of the considerations here, of course, are, you know, the direction we select in terms of the program scope and funding structure, um, in terms of, you know, district program alignment and capacity, how do we balance that, what are the partner needs, and the ability to influence um, projects as well. And so the recommendation is to leverage a broad range of services to support and influence project uh, development throughout their life cycle. So these services could come in at project concept, at feasibility or implementation, uh, instead of just providing funding at that implementation stage. And so um, some examples of this could be providing technical assistance or planning assistance um, or data collection support. Um, so we're again providing the right service at the right time um, during that project phase. And so this is one of the areas where we feel like we need to have further discussions with the board. Um, we have a wide range of services that are currently being listed. But the question is, which ones are we really willing to provide service on? Which ones are kind of off the table? Or which ones maybe do we won't only want to offer up at some certain threshold? And so a good example of this would be operations and maintenance. Um, do we want to keep that completely on the table? Do we want to keep it off the table? Or is it something where it's only in particular cases that's a service that we're willing to provide? And so the rationale for this recommendation of a range of services is to provide incentive for our partners to invite the district into their planning process um, early in exchange for the services, right? So again, bridging that gap. Um, the request to the district include uh, partners to seek for a, a support in areas beyond uh, just funding. So sometimes they'll come to us for technical assistance or planning assistance. And we've already been seeing this through the pilot phase as well, where it's not always a funding request. They're looking for um, help and our expertise in a different area. And then this also provides the district with flexibility uh, to provide um, projects and uh, support in a variety of ways. And so I think a really strong example of this is the work in Long Lake Creek partnership. Right, we've provided a range of services um, for this uh, pilot phase of project where we've provided the technical support, we've provided uh, the planning support. Um, and so by pulling those all together, we've really provided benefit for that area. And so with that, we have kind of now walked through kind of the heart of the program in terms of the scope and structure. And so I'll just kind of briefly summarize here before we go into discussion. Um, so for scope and eligibility, we're looking for right capital projects that have that regional benefit with partners that have the capacity to implement is the recommendation. Um, for the watershed management plan connection in our funding mechanism, we're proposing to use um, option one as the backbone of the program, so funding project implementation through our CIP. And then in terms of district services, uh, we're looking to offer a range of services that support projects throughout concept, feasibility, and or implementation. <coughs> and so this really does boil down to kind of one decision. Do we want to go with a focused CIP approach or do we want to go with this kind of grant program? And so for discussion, um, some items you know, to consider are, you know, are the board comfortable with these recommendations? Do they align with your expectations for the program? Um, what are some of those opportunities and challenges that we've already kind of flagged a couple? Does the board anticipate uh, for this proposed program? And then what are the questions and concerns and what areas need additional information um, or need additional discussion? And, um, you know, again, this is kind of the first touch point with the board on this, so we will be coming back with the district service discussion as well to have a more robust discussion around that. Does anyone want to weigh in on any of those questions? I, I support the staff's recommendation to be focused in the CIP approach um, regarding the <coughs> services offered. Um, I think your example of Long Lake 
is a great one where the technical planning and some data support was provided. I think that's exactly a value the district can add for those partners and um, it's something communities or projects will seek out. I think that is super helpful. Um, you have a longer list in your memo of um, related to land and I can't tell if we'd be providing legal services or contracting with consultants sharing in the cost of that. I'm not, I don't think we have the internal capacity for those services, but that's a few of the listings are about land rights or land appraisal. So I'm, I'm not quite clear on that, but like you said, there's time to work all that out. And then I would initially not think that we would offer O&M services without ownership, and I would imagine these sorts of projects would not include our ownership, that these are projects initiated by another entity, so we wouldn't likely have ownership in them, and I don't really have a strong interest in operating and maintaining something I don't own, or the district, you know, I, I, I don't know why we would offer that up, unless we're exceptionally good at it, which I'm not aware of, are we? I, not yet. Yeah, oh great, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, you know, are we looking to become a maintenance department? And then the question is, do you want to be? So, right, you know, and so without ownership, I just, I can't imagine wanting that as an offering. But those are, that's my thoughts. Helpful. Yeah, I think we've got sort of everything on the table at this point, but, you know, realistically, I mean, that's why we want to bring that back and just figure out, okay, what are we really never going to be interested in or what's, you know, just how do we set clear expectations for our partners of what actually is on the table <coughs> and what circumstances so yeah. that it's not a big negotiation. Very helpful. I've thought about expectations. We first discussed this in, in a planning committee about, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, I can't remember. And I think that the idea for me of, of having a responsive program was what if a request comes in that's not in a focal geography? And that's what I was really thinking about. So that our, in reality and in perception, we aren't limiting ourselves to two or three geographies but we're open to other projects and so this far exceeds my expectations and the way it, it's being put together it would include something that was within a focal geography a new opportunity that comes up um, and I, I'm very pleased with that but it's not limited to mm -hmm. right no it's, well, open to, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's to yeah. go beyond the focal geography yeah. Yeah. that's important I think that was the first iteration of it <clears throat> I think one, one of the nuts that we'll have to crack, and I think I just said this, but I'm just nervous about it, so I'm going to say it again, is how, when we say services, um, it's really program support. It's, it's the people. It's Brian doing diagnostic or monitoring. Um, so we have to decide, are we contracting out? And is that, are those soft costs when we say services? Um, when we do, you know, land management planning, we have some expertise internally on, like, you know, negotiation, easements, those sorts of things, but outreach, you know, when we say program support, what are we talking about and how do we actually plan for that? Because that's uh, something that we're trying to get better at. So, and, and, and how do we keep capacity? You know, how do you keep reserve capacity in your program so that when someone comes knocking and wants all these services, um, do we just have 20% of people's time not utilized until we have the right project? Because the way that we're aligning the organization right now is to have our programs of research and monitoring is diagnosing the watershed and driving project design. It's monitoring efficacy on the backside of construction that's been that's gotten to that point through really focused, targeted outreach. Um, and then we're maintaining those projects. So that's a question I have that um, I'm not sure that we have the answer to yet. When, when we had a grant program, it was kind of like we were saying, we're opening our coffers, you know, make up something that'll fit our criteria. I mean, that was sometimes how it went. And there's the way of marketing this, or whatever you call it, has to not look like we're just opening the doors. Um, it has to not be invitation, necessarily. There's, I'm sure there's a balance in there somewhere. Other questions or concerns or areas you want to know more about? Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs>
Moving along now to the scheduling process. So we have five more of these key decision points to walk through. Those are the big ones, though. <laughs> yes. Okay. So yeah, we just did the big ones. Um, so we'll start with uh, process and schedule. And so what is the review process and the program timeline? And so the considerations here, you know, how much time is needed to review, to evaluate, to respond? Um, should the program take projects on an ongoing basis? Um, how, how we've been doing that with the pilot phase so far? Or do we want to have set deadlines or kind of dates that we want to set um, for these potential partners? And then of course, how would the CIP and budget process be integrated into the program process? And so um, in terms of um, kind of how the process is set up, um, I've already kind of alluded to this, but right, we have this phase one project concept, and then it would feed into this phase two project feasibility and then implementation. So we're kind of mirroring, you know, a classic kind of project delivery process here. Um, and so phase one project really is trying to figure out, is something real? Is there an opportunity here? And this is where we see um, it's kind of looking at, you know, is there the regional benefit? What's, you know, are we hitting these kind of big items? And then from there, if there's a kind of a stop point, and if, you know, it looks like it ex kind of exceeds um, in terms of, you know, there is something there in terms of benefits and coordination, um, that's a decision point for the board, which I'll touch on in the role section. And then in the feasibility section, that's really where we're trying to figure out you know, what are the numbers, um, you know, what is the true benefit, what does the project actually look like, and kind of fleshing out all those details and feasibility. And so then, again, before you move into project, or uh, into project implementation phase three, there's another stop point there, so another off-ramp, right, where the board can say yes or no. Um, and so that's kind of the process piece. Um, and so for the schedule, right, um, that's how we're going to tie these two together. So we have this process with built-in decision points. Um, we then also have established deadlines that feed into this process that allow us to have adequate time to review um, and have any required actions taken care of. Um, and so then this would allow us to basically uh, follow into a CIP schedule, right? So we're actually then kind of controlling the pace of these opportunities. We have the time to set those management expectations in. We have time to develop and look at these projects. Um, so again, just like with uh, district services, this is one area where we want to continue to revise the proposed schedule, um, both with district uh, staff and planning and the board, and also with the TAC, because really we want to make sure this schedule and process works for our community partners as well. And then of course for the faster moving private projects, as we had talked about, it would still follow these three phases, but it could be condensed down because it would be decoupled from that CIP piece. And so the rationale, um, so right, is allows for an effective and efficient administration of the program. It provides um, the time needed to review and act on project requests. It allows the district to review all the projects on this kind of similar timeline as we're looking at our budget development piece. Um, and then we have kind of this kind of side piece where we can be nimble through these faster moving projects um, and kind of condense, uh, condense down on that schedule. And then it also allows the timeline for the district to really consider its financial and then staff capacity as well. And so that is uh, the rationale piece for schedule and process. Um, I guess any um, clarifying questions for this piece? That's good. Angela. Um, James, your concern about staff capacity I'm sure you meant to tee it up with the deadlines, but yeah. I would say that is how you manage yeah. timing and or the importance of deadlines really is so that you can get applicants on a cycle where they can get a decision, but if there's just not capacity to take on every project, we say at the CIP level, look, we're interested, but it's going to be a budget year out or two budget years out or is there flexibility on your timing? Because right. um, if you're reacting year round and getting pulled yeah. and approving it year round, you're going to be, that's when you're going to have people pulled in too many directions and not be able to plan for it. Yeah. So maybe those deadlines help that concern? Well, I think they will. I mean, gating the process so that we receive a concept and then we're evaluating the concept on its merits. And that's the point at which you're hopefully kind of separating a lot of the wheat from the, the, the 
which half, and then you're figuring out well, which ones are going to go into the, the feasibility. And it's going to be a limited subset, so there's a winnowing process right there. It's at that feasibility stage you could probably plan out and game out if we're going to be involved in this at a support program support level, you know, what's it going to take? But in my experience with that's where th that's where the projects are made is in feasibility and the diagnostics and effective planning versus receiving a pre baked idea that we then fund, like, you know, some of the yeah. projects that we've had issues with. And so that that but that still might come up last minute, but those yeah. aren't going to pull your staff mostly. Right. Those will be mostly funding projects. I think so, yeah. yeah, on the feasibility side of it with consulting services. Um, and then, like you said, when you get into the CIP, you're putting everything apples to apples, our own projects that we're driving, that our planner project managers are assigned to, your research and monitoring, and you're looking at, well, what's the interplay um, as these projects get slid into the CIP? <coughs> So as a board, we'll have to be more focused and deliberate on our CIP deliberations each year mm -hmm. and be more so. careful about prioritizing and Well, and staff will too. I mean, we're growing deck. as an organization and that's the, you know, we've talked about it. That's one thing that we just need to keep getting better at as we loop up. If we're going to try and tackle larger scale improvements that we're driving and we're the catalyst on our own and remain responsive or whatever the program name ends up being. <laughs> um, I've got some ideas I want to get in the... Need a good list. acronym. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's the thing that we'll have to keep getting better at. Staffing was what I was going to say too, so thank you for saying that. Um, if we have to jump on something right now and staff just gets pulled from one project to another, that's really inefficient. And so that argues in favor of the timing of it. Yeah, yeah the deadlines. Absolutely. And making the, I think... Making the deadlines reasonable enough for our municipal partners to engage in and not be a barrier, but work for us. Um, that we're not crunching down our deadlines to, to try and, you know, chunk yeah. through too much work in three months or four months. So extra, that'll be something that we'll really have to navigate with the advisory committee. Because I think we'll be looking to sync up with their capital improvement planning processes. And that's where I think a lot of the action is at a policy level, is integrating how they do their capital project planning with our, our process and our machinery. If those two things over time start to talk to each other better, um, that's going to be a real positive in terms of our relationships and impact on the landscape. And we might need um, to think of our CIP differently if you're trying to time it up with partners. Like maybe our CIP happens in February or March. We talked about that. It needs and, to be earlier in the year. Um, because you need to be able to say to a proposal, you know, we like what you're saying. This is typically the month we get decisions for people, but yep. let's work on this. You don't want everyone to wait till the last minute to throw concepts at you. Mm -hmm. Um, but you also need to be able to manage expectations about when. Yeah. And if you're talking about mostly municipal partners, they have the same uh, legal requirements of when to do their yeah. budget. So you'd have to find a way to get right. in right. front of them, which you could with your CIP. Yeah, and I think we're going deep here on CIP. Oh. Okay, it's, it's sorry. Super, it's, I'm, it's really fun. It's what we should be talking about. Um, so fun. Yeah. Nerding out on CIPs. Um, it is. That's I think great. the capital improvement plan right now is sort of a it's a Swiss Army knife, and we'll talk about this during the retreat a little bit. I think is just we're using our CIP, the list that we publish, as a way to solicit requests, um, as well as communicate out what our priorities are. But we're not sort of going through a rigorous process each year of looking at the trade offs and setting priorities. So there's just a whole lot there. I think requesting concepts, you know, and they have the timelines in really early, um, you can decouple that from publishing your CIP. Yeah. So you're getting concepts, making the decision, then there's a dis then the board's having a decision on if they fold into the CIP through feasibility. So the timelines and the deadlines, there's a lot in there to figure out. And mm -hmm. I know But Becky generally you have, we support deadlines. You know, you're going to need yes. them to keep your sanity. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've that been encouraging the them to. I think they started with really tight deadlines to be responsive. Yeah. Like sanity. <laughs> <laughs> we moved it back a few times. Yeah. Now. I think we still are dialing it in. It's all good. Should we let the board get that? So, so it's private or public. Do we ever do we go out and initiate any of those projects? Then? 
ourselves. Do we have the time and effort to do that, or we just wait for them to come to us? That's an excellent Good question. Yeah. <laughs> it is coming up. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. To, maybe for the sake of time, we'll wait till we get there and then let me have additional questions. Um, all right, so moving along uh, to board and staff roles. So, what are the staff roles in implementing this program, and what are the points of engagement for the board and managers? Um, of course, some of the considerations are the organizational alignment, of course, capacity, and how the cross departmental coordination is going to work. Uh, the roles and responsibilities, and then, of course, the oversight from the board of managers. And so the recommendation here is project identification and evaluation will be led by staff. So, uh, you know, traditionally we'll see public projects being led by policy planning staff. Private projects would be led likely by permitting staff. And then all the projects would be vetted through that cross-departmental evaluation team. In terms of point of engagement for the board of managers, um, the first is at least annually, and this could be this would be set by the board of managers, who would look at an update at committee on the program operations and opportunities that are currently in that phase one concept. And then decision point for the board will decide whether a project moves um, from that phase one into phase two. And then the same thing, the board will also then decide if the district will pro uh, proceed from that phase two feasibility into phase three implementation. Um, and those are the instances where the board would be providing services. And so the rationale here is, right, it provides these natural checkpoints between the staff and the board so we can maintain that organizational alignment. It provides the board with a snapshot of the range of opportunities coming in, the status of those opportunities, and also the potential for partnership. It establishes the board's oversight and then the approval um, for any you know, significant staff or financial resources for these project uh, you know, feasibility and implementation. And then also the division of staff roles between policy planning and permitting, um, that increases staff capacity because we're spreading out those that work. It promotes the staff growth and retention and also allows for a single point of contact for partners from project identification mm -hmm. through implementation. And so um, for board and staff roles, that um, is the recommendation and rationale. Any kind of clarifying questions for board and staff roles? Just really quickly, um, would you, in those scenarios, have someone like a frontline permit tech staying with that project or coupling up with a more experienced staff member to stay with it but have assistance? They wouldn't be growing that much to where they're uh, taking on and managing the whole project themselves, right? That's an excellent question, Manager uh, Loftus. Um, and so with that, we actually are dra drafting out these internal processes. So it's really allowing us both from the permitting side and from the policy planning side, kind of what are the to-do steps. And okay. as you have, you, let's say for your permitting tech, an opportunity comes in, you consider this opportunity. Um, then you're still working with this cross, you know, departmental team. You're still coordinating with policy planning because um, we have to still have understand of all the opportunities that are going on. Um, so there's these kind of natural points where people can kind of learn from each other and will continue to learn and refine the guidance too over time. So I think it's one of those like looping up. Yeah, and I think we want to certainly develop the ability for all permitting staff to effectively screen permits that are coming through and flag opportunities. And then once it gets to actual, you know, negotiations and, and some of those things that are maybe a little um, more challenging, I think there'd be close, you know, oversight and involvement of the permitting program manager and, and um, potentially drawing from, from policy planning as well to make sure that they are equipped to do that effectively. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some, some training and, and guidance that needs to, to go along with this. Moving along to opportunity identification. Um, so how does the district effectively and efficiently identify opportunities? Um, so some of the considerations are, you know, how are we actually going to do this early identification? How do you identify your public and private project opportunities? And then how do you actually determine these proactive and passive pathways for identification? Um, right, so we're not always out trying to seek out these projects, right? How do we actually make these projects come to us as well? And so the recommendation here is, right, under the responsive program, the intent is to identify uh, projects that can be developed collaboratively. 
So the project um, you know, must be identified at a time where the district and the partner goals can still be fully realized within that collaborative framework. Um, and so with that, um, we're recommending, right, basically having these different pathways come in, whether it's proactive or passive, um, both from permitting and policy planning to really identify these public and um, private opportunities. So in terms of some public pathways, right, we'd be looking at the municipal local water management plans and then the respective coordination plans that's tied to that. We have our annual exchange review of CIPs, um, annual meetings with the municipal, county, and other agency partners. And then we'd also have those project-specific requests coming in from our public partners. And so, right, those are all the kind of public, both, you know, proactive and then passive pathways coming in from the public side. Uh, for the private pathways, right, we have our district staff screening permit applications. We have pre-application uh, review requests via the new uh, permitting portal as part of the permitting alignment effort. We have municipal agreements um, with private developers for the review and permitting process, again, with the permitting alignment effort, so kind of marrying those up. And then, of course, we'd have those project-specific requests and coordination from those private developers as well. So we're trying to capture all these different ways of these opportunities coming in. And of course, both these pathways would be supported through the overall program and how we're setting up the structure, but it would also continue to be strengthened by efforts of marketing the program and providing very clear guidance externally. And so for the rationale, right, we're looking, um, the approach is just providing clear pathways for the district to identify those land use changes during these critical windows, right? So that allows us to avoid missing these opportunities with both the public and the private implementers of the land use side. So, any clarifying questions for opportunity identification? Looks like we're good. Um, so, criterion evaluation process. So, how does the district evaluate opportunities to determine whether or how it'll provide support? So, some of those considerations are, you know, what is the priority for the district? What is the type and level of support you know, the district wants to uh, uh, provide? How does the system, you know, do we want a more qualitative or quantitative um, kind of system in terms of how we evaluate and how would that best serve the program? And so the recommendation here is consistent with the approach we've been using during the pilot phase. So staff recommendation um, that opportunities be evaluated using the following four criteria. So right, I had gone through that in our previous action item. So right, we had the resource need and priority, we have the project benefits, we have the cost effectiveness and the coordination and partnership. Um, and you can also see an attachment two in your memo is basically the level down. Um, so you can see those overall and then kind of the sub questions that allow us for this rank based approach. And so, right, so the staff would then go through these considerations, rank these low, medium, or high uh, for these four categories, and then document the reasoning for the ranking. Um, and so this approach of this high level ranking is preferred over the scored system. Um, such as those for a grant program, because it really provides a meaningful comparison of opportunities without being overly rigid or formulaic about it. And so um, lastly, through that rank-based approach, it would also then be vetted through a cross department <coughs> team for review as well. Um, and so that's how we move through this criterion evaluation process. <coughs> so the rationale here is, right, it provides partners with a clear and transparent evaluation framework, right? We're looking for these four criteria. It provides a meaningful comparison of our projects without being too rigid, so we have that flexibility built in, um, but we're still looking at the merit of every project. And then it also includes um, these kind of criteria category that really incentivizes early coordination. And so in particular, <coughs> um, that's that coordination and partnership last piece, so that, that fourth item. And so again, right, say like a project comes in right at implementation looking for funding, they would get ranked lower. So again, we're trying to learn and teach people to come in earlier, ideally a concept or you know, very early in feasibility. And so with that, any questions for criterion evaluation process? All right. Program funding. <laughs> so how is the responsive program funded? So considerations here, of course, um, you know, this is dictated by kind of the scope and the funding mechanisms and the services that um, we decide to go with. Um, but of course, we're looking at the type and then the timing to respond to these project opportunities. And so the recommendation here is we basically have three avenues for this program. And so the first one is this responsive planning of uh, budget line item. And so this is actually consistent with the budget practices during the pilot phase. And so there's a line item that would be included for both planning and also permitting departments called responsive planning. 
and this would really be used for project development services uh, during concept and feasibility. So it would help us to kind of explore the opportunities, provide low-level services, to really kind of vet and see you know, what this opportunity is. And then the next item, um, and I guess to also note for that one, um, those amounts would be set annually by the board, and those would be informed by previous year, right, what was coming in from the previous year, and then also it's subject to the delegated spending authorities of the administrator, so there is a limit there. And then in terms of the CIP, the, the project implementation, so this is again the backbone, requests for funding are received um, in time for review and incorporation into the district's annual budget. And then that third item is our capital finance subfund. And so this is our strategic reserve. And this provides that ability for us to be nimble for those private or faster moving projects. And it provides flexibility, right, for us to be able to move quickly for those. Um, and so those are the three items for the program funding. Um, capital uh, finance subfund. I don't, I don't believe that we should look at that fund as a uh, as a uh, cash basin for every project. Uh, you know, we've we've got agreements uh, it, uh, with with banks and with counties and everything else on how we're going to maintain reserves and and. Uh, I, I think I think we got to be very careful about uh, using it as a slush fund, so to speak. I, 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 that's kind of a loose term. I don't mean that you got to be reckless, but that we're very careful about how we uh, use the capital finance because uh, it's, it's both a source of capital funding and it's a, and it's a, and it's a source of the debt service payments which was the primary reason for establishing it. Mr. Whisker. I, I agree with Manager Miller, and I think in general, the approach for all of our projects going forward as they get, as they move into the capital improvement plan at you know, the board's discretion and get shuffled and prioritized is for each of our projects, we need to know the benefits, the risks, the costs. We also need to understand the funding strategy and for each project, what we need to be thinking about is what are the available grants that could support this project within reason. Um, it's, it's no different than the financial analysis we've done with Lattice's proposal. You look at how many <coughs> grants are available in the region, how much are we likely to get in a calendar year. Um, we're going to look at um, how we could levy into that project over time or can we levy for it in one year. Is our partner, if it's a municipal partner, are they willing to issue debt on our behalf and have us service the debt? And then the capital finance subfund is a strategic source to balance out those, um, those other sources um, to manage cash flow, levy, and, and budget over time. So I don't think the intent, there's probably a lot in that bullet point, but I think the idea is for every single project moving forward, we want to have a funding strategy that's clearly mapped out with the board at the beginning that looks at levy, grants, partner contributions, and then as that CIP is developed, we'll have a stronger forecast of what the costs are going to be and we'll be able to make more informed decisions and tie our CIP um, to the cash that we have available within capital finance while knowing what our permanent debt obligations are too. I think that that's something that we've been talking about tracking towards the last couple budget cycles. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Yeah, I'm not going to answer it. Like you're not satisfied? No. Okay. <laughs> I think your, your comment is, it's not that we're going to the CIP for a slush fund, it's that we're putting the project pro that's proposed into the CIP. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the, the basics of it are that within capital finance, we, you know, we're more than... Um, double covered on debt, and that's something that the board's identified as you know, we've increased our cash position, and we need to understand um, how that's supporting our long-range capital improvement balanced against grants, other debt that's coming online that's issued by our partners and our levy. And we don't have answers to that, and if that's not an accurate interpretation of what we've discussed so far, I'm happy to be re-educated. This one says fast, fast moving projects. I don't remember hearing the term sub fund. Have we been using that? And I just didn't no, remember it. Not that I remember. Okay. I don't believe there's anything hey. limiting you from creating 
a capital improvement, a, a correctly named fund inside yeah. the capital improvement and finding resources to put in there. It doesn't right. have to be the same as our debt service financing. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that you have limitations on it. We don't. The different envelope. Right. Uh, this is groceries and this is Well, I mean, debt. you know, and if it, if it keeps the well, debt yeah. stuff separate and keeps, yeah. I, yeah. I think you're unlimited in how you can divvy that up, I believe. And to that point, I would ask, is the line item in the operating budget to, is the purpose to track staff expenses or is that consultant contracts for specific services up to whatever it is, your 25 or 50,000 limit, whatever we have here, I should know. Yeah. yeah, manager left is five managers. Five. It would be mainly for consultant for support. Consultant so sending okay. something over to Stantec to review, um, you know, their modeling or something yeah. like that. Or and and we probably don't have the need for the sophistication of it, but if it's related to a capital project, you can finance it out of your capital fund. But generally okay. speaking, if it's an operating expense, it should be in your general budget. Um, so I... Just curious what your rationale on dividing those up would be, and there's probably a million ways you can cut that pie up. Right, and yeah, manager office manager. So that line item would be just for things that are in sort of the concept stage um, or feasibility stage, where it's just sort of a quick, you know, five thousand dollar or less work order to, to Stantec to review a, a feasibility report or some cost estimate numbers. Um, or their engineer? Is it always our? Is it us directing that? Or? Whatever. That's I mean, we probably be, Never I mind. mean, typically we're reviewing something that their engineer produces and, and just I sort see. of checking their, their numbers. Okay. Um, it's sort of been the most frequent use of that line item to date. Okay. Anything else? Generally agree with the recommendation. Can nuance the names of it, I think. But. Manager Millick, would you care to give more insight or direction? Uh, we. Uh, Made the agreements on uh, on our uh, capital funding uh, loan program, uh, maintaining a certain amount of, of, of reserves uh, for the debt service, <coughs> and then we expanded a little bit for uh, the uh, general reserves would flow in and out through that, uh, but it was no. Uh, there, there's no a special. When you get sub funds, then everybody feels obligated to, fund, to spend it. You know, like most uh, cities bond for capital improvements, except you know the, the, the planning cost goes in there, and then the operating uh, costs, and then all of a sudden, it, new equipment goes in there, and you know it just it it you 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 lose track of of what what the mission of the capital program is, because everybody else, can, mm -hmm. well, we, we contributed to the capital program, so we should It should be, be one-time, yeah. it should be right. one-time projects, is what it should be. Mm -hmm. And ones that got long-term life. Right. Uh, otherwise, it should be an operating cost, you know, yep. not a capital cost. Mm -hmm. If we, if we <clears throat> had a party come to us and say, <clears throat> We want to clean up our lake, and we want to get rid of carp, and you guys are the experts. So here's this grant money that we've come up with, but we want you guys to manage it, to take it over. Would, is that something we would ever entertain? I'm thinking Long Lake right now. If somebody were to show up and say, you've proved that you can do this. You did it to Wasserman. I want you to do it to our lake. Here's the money, because we know you're good at it. Well, I think that's a question for the board. I mean, I don't want to get into semantics. Cart management would be a programmatic activity, and so um, it falls outside of the scope of what staff's defining here as we're focusing on how do we intake high-impact capital improvements from municipal partners. So, you know, this is that would be a highly unusual scenario, I think, where um, a public partner showed up with um, a large pool of grant resources and didn't want to implement it themselves, but had designed the program, pursued the grants, gotten the grants, not talked to us, and then said, here, you just run it for us. I think that would be strange. 
um, I can't imagine us being in that situation, but if, if someone were generous enough to take it all the way to the finish line but had some issues or capacity implementing it, it benefited the watershed and they had the funding for it, I think we'd get that in front of the board. Okay. We wouldn't get it in front of the board within the confines of this program. We'd bring it forward and say, here, there's this opportunity. Partner A has approached us. They've got this great concept. They have the funding for it. Here's what it would take in terms of staff capacity to implement. <coughs> Here's how it would compete with all the other priorities that you have. And you'd have a decision to make. Okay. That'd be more of a one-off. I think so. I mean, it's n I'm trying to think of a situation where that, like an analog that, that has happened. Like, I don't have one. Okay. And I think going back to the capital finance, I think the idea is that those are capital dollars. We're not talking about spending those on soft costs, programmatic operations. And I do think that we have talked about, we have um, self-imposed policies as well as commitments to our, part, to our partners who have issue, issued debt and we have obligations to, to have a certain amount of annual coverage in that account for the annual debt service. And we have more than that. And what we need to, what we've talked about is are we separating debt service from capital reserves and how do capital reserves flow into projects and when and under what conditions and how's the board planning for that and making those decisions. And to me, the best way of doing that is if projects come in from partners or staffs developing projects in our focal program, we should have a fund, we should know the costs and then the funding strategy, how much we're levying in, uh, how much we're likely to get from grants if our partner's issuing debt, and then the capital reserves that sit in whatever fund you want to call it, and maybe we separate those out, we'll have to understand how and when those fold in. Sure. Okay. For the discussion. Yeah. Great. I'm not a public finance expert, so <laughs> I'm, I will follow the board's lead. Um, so with that, we have now covered um, all eight of these key um, decision points. Um, and so I'll just briefly summarize the kind of schedule process one. Um, so right for process and schedule, we're looking to establish a structured process along with the district's annual CIP and budget development process. The board and staff roles, right, there's key staff leads, and the board determines if a project proceeds at these kind of milestones. Um, opportunity identification, um, right, we're looking for how we bring in both pro uh, proactively and passively from our public and private par partners. And then our criterion evaluation process, um, right, we have these criteria categories with a rate-based approach. Um, and then for program funding, right, we are looking kind of at these three different avenues um, to help support the program. And so with that, um, open it up for discussion uh, for schedule and process or overall remaining questions at this point. Um, And again, this is our first time, you know, coming to the board. We recognize we're going to be coming back with district services and schedule for further discussion, but we'll also reflect back what we've heard here today and if there's any other items that we should add to that discussion list. Anything else at this point? Do you roughly know the date your pilot officially started? <laughs> I would say probably last March for... <laughs> started, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it was late 2019 that we kind of had brought some draft goals and, and criteria forward. Mm -hmm. I don't know when you know, opportunities started really, when our first one was reviewed under that, but um, I guess that would be the rough timeline, so it's been about a year and a half. We've sort of been in pilot okay. mode. Thanks. You remember the last year and a half? <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Yes. I had one question. Go ahead. Ms. Moran, did you know your first presentation was going to Marathon? Or? <laughs> no, and if not, like, well I done. I really appreciate the kindness. Yeah. <laughs> I will. I will level up or whatever circle up here. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so thank you for bearing with me on this marathon one. Um, and I'll just briefly talk to next steps here. Um, so again, right, we'll follow up with the board um, for additional discussions. Um, right in September, we will be coming back to discuss and request authorization to commence the stakeholder engagement process, right, which would include that TAC piece. Um, at the same time, we'll be continue to refine the program and the materials um, for that stakeholder engagement process um, and also all the supporting materials for this program. And again, we're looking for that early 22 um, um, adoption of the program through that responsive program implementation guidance. So 
Thank you for listening to me for an hour and 21 minutes for this one alone. <laughs> Thank you. Very Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. We'll move now to uh, Mr. Dietrich, permitting program alignment. An hour and 21 minutes. Let's do a time check. His memo says there's some overlap and it'll be shorter. He said that. Okay. I read that. He also overlap had 30 some Support. pages of supporting documents. In and I'm going to read each page very slowly. Yeah. <laughs> was it double spaced? Uh, I think it was one of the Reciting half. all the punctuation. <laughs> Uh, good evening, President White, managers. Uh, before the board this evening, the discussion is permitting's alignment effort. Uh, it's an overview of the initiative, uh, the previous discussions with the board, and the proposed changes that we've identified. What is um, the picture? This is actually uh, the headwaters of the creek, um, and somebody is in a kayak. I, I think oh, Trevor. Oh, kayak. Okay. Yeah. Here, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, what did you think was his hand? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I realized that. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know that Raffi song our kids do, Shake Your Sillies oh. Out, it's time. It's yeah. time. <laughs> so I realized it is a little bit late, um, and I had intended to go through some background information. Um, I'm just going to frame uh, kind of what I'm looking um, for the uh, to get out of tonight, um, and then maybe glance over the, the background since you have heard this uh, a little bit before, and then focus a little bit more on our outcomes. Um, so really the purpose for this evening is to provide the board um, with uh, an outline of the program changes that we've identified through our analysis. Um, and we're really looking to assess the board's comfort with advancing some of the direction that we're going to be outlining associated with the analysis to the attack for additional feedback. Um, there are going to be a few items I'm going to highlight tonight that will be uh, back in front of the board prior to um, both permitting and the responsive program requesting authorization to go forward with the TAC process. Um, so this evening, um, we're going to be focusing on a few key areas, um, and it's really going to be highlighting the draft mechanisms and frameworks that um, we've developed in support of the policy shifts that we've identified previously. Um, so I'm going to be stopping briefly at each section just to um, assess the board's feedback, understand if, uh, if we're comfortable with uh, moving things forward. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll just be very briefly highlighting um, the next steps in the process and some, some key upcoming milestones. Um, similar to, to what Ms. Moran and Ms. Christopher outlined. Um, so this is the background that I'm going to kind of breeze through here. Um, but uh, suffice it to say that the uh, program alignment for permitting has really emanated from the 2017 plan um, and uh, the organizing uh, or the organizational philosophy of the balanced urban ecology policy. Um, and in trying to uh, align the permitting program around that larger policy, we're really looking at three major buckets of work. That's HR, IT, and then the rule and program revisions, which will be the focus of our discussion tonight. Um, so the last time that we spoke, um, we outlined some of the historical issues and drivers that permitting has routinely faced over its history. Um, and just to very uh, quickly go through them, um, one of the first ones that we highlighted was that the rule language and the administrative process um, is difficult for applicants and communities. Um, it's, it's not well aligned with uh, local and state standards, um, and it, uh, it can create confusion. It's also very technically dense and sometimes difficult to approach. Um, our compliance framework has limited actionable measures and consequences, um, and that, that's kind of affected um, the seriousness with which issues are taken when they do arise. Um, and also uh, underpinning this is we don't really have a risk management framework to guide staff's priorities um, when we're considering field compliance. Um, we're typically engaged late in the land use process, um, and that one's a little bit more self-explanatory. Generally, when people are coming to us, it's late in the game after all of their key decisions have been made, um, and it really affects the amount of creativity we can bring to the table um, and how a site may be configured uh, for possible opportunities. Um, and then finally, um, we don't have established policy frameworks, and uh, that is largely um, what Ms. Moran and Ms. Christopher just uh, presented to you is um, some of the policy frameworks that we are developing. But traditionally, um, we've had difficulty with um, creating partnership opportunities because there's not a repeatable process to follow. It's more or less ad hoc and something that's been more or less of a campfire story handed down from uh, senior staff to, to junior staff. 
Um, so following the, um, the historical issues that we had discussed, we outlined a few policy solutions and strategies that we had also um, agreed upon um, in, in 2019, and then we reiterated on June 10th. Um, so instead of going through each of these, um, I'm just going to highlight the three ones in bold. Um, so tonight we're really going to be focusing on promoting early engagement, um, really how we're, we're devising strategies to um, get applicants in early and set uh, expectations and create mechanisms that allow that to be possible. Um, we're going to define how we act as a value-added partner. And again, that's largely through um, some of the processes Ms. Moran and Ms. Christopher just spoke to. Um, and then finally, we're going to be talking about refining the compliance framework. Um, really what we're um, looking at there is how we're structuring our risk management framework um, and then how we're also going to be um, really starting to uh, add some clarity to the uh, escalation steps that we have um, for our own uh, compliance tools and what the range of actions the board has at its disposal should a compliance issue come up. So that was the very quick uh, overview of what we've talked about before. Um, so that'll just take us right into um, what the proposed uh, program changes are. Um, so that'll be the, the focus of this evening again, um, promoting early engagement, uh, defining how we act as a value-added partner, and then um, refining the compliance framework. Um, so just as context, uh, I'm just going to touch briefly on the rationale behind some of the changes that we're proposing, and then describe the direction that we'd like to bring forward to the TAC, um, and then we'll be looking for um, board feedback if we're if we're all comfortable moving these forward um, and then um, just keep in mind too that there's going to be a few items that we'll be bringing back to the board before um, before the TAC process as we uh, kind of complete our drafts and analysis um, so for promoting early engagement some of the most uh, basic issues that we've experienced as a department have really related back to when we're involved in the process um, and oftentimes what we're heavily relying on is uh, relationships with our member cities. Um, it's worked with limited success in the past. Uh, the problem is, is that it's extremely inconsistent. So you can have a very good understanding with uh, other city staff. However, as soon as there's changeover or a change in dynamic at a, a certain city, um, the entire arrangement can come crashing down and then you need to start over and rebuild the relationship. So there needs to be a little bit more consistency and a more of a metered way of directing specific projects to the district at specific times. Um, second, we, we don't really have awareness amongst the regulated public um, or our member cities about the unique way that the district conducts its business. Um, and that limited awareness really hampers our ability to, to shape and steer projects. And it also keeps us from capitalizing on, on opportunities um, that can be discovered through the land use process. Uh, and then finally, um, the late engagement really sets us up for conflict. Um, it really affects relationships and it detracts from the, the brand that MCWD has really worked so hard to cultivate. Um, if we're uh, providing regulatory comments on a site that's already been uh, through the, the land use process where these decisions have already been made, if we're undoing that by providing our own regulatory comments late in the, late in the process, we're essentially undoing those decisions, um, creating uh, very controversial relationships with um, with our member cities um, and then even more so uh, a level of conflict with the private uh, land use community um, where additional time resources need to be sunk back into a project in order to kind of steer the ship uh, in the correct direction so um, to solve for these issues staff is really proposing three primary solutions um, so first we're looking to formalize integration to local planning and zoning process Second, develop formal marketing materials. And then third, um, implementing a no-cost, efficient pre-application review track. So I'll just briefly describe um, what we have in mind for these. Um, so by formalizing uh, permitting integration into local uh, planning and zoning process, we're really undertaking a, a, a relatively simple step of defining how we work co cooperatively with a uh, local process, um, outlining um, what projects we're interested in, meaning uh, the ones that are most likely to yield uh, potential opportunities. Um, we're specifying um, when we can be, uh, when is the district we can be most effectively engaged. Um, we're outlining how the city can notify us or direct an applicant to us. And then finally outlining what the city can expect from us in terms of response. And then memorializing this in, in a formal agreement which can insulate us um, from, from changes at the city level, um, should there be staff changeover or other dynamic shifting. 
Um, so the responses that we have in mind can be structured just as simply as the, the agreement that we're suggesting to. Um, as simple as if we're getting something um, in front of us, we're responding to the city that um, there's actually not an opportunity present, but here are our regulatory comments that you can incorporate into your planning commission packet or your council packet so we can move the project efficiently through both processes. Or we can notify them that there is an opportunity present and then we can really start beginning the, the steps that Ms. Moran outlined in uh, the responsive implementation guidance. Uh, so second, uh, we're recommending that formal marketing materials are developed in coordination with the responsive program. Um, so a part of the, the issues that we experience that are associated with early engagement are, are attributed to the public's lack of awareness of the district's unique way of doing business. So the more that we can preemptively engage audiences, um, both through permitting and the responsive program, the more likely we are to identify and capitalize on uh, project uh, opportunities and avoid conflict simultaneously. Um, so this is less of an item that we're looking to vet with the TAC, um, more of one that we're informing them what supplemental tools we're developing um, that are going to support building partnerships with the districts. But as the materials are developed, um, we're gonna be bringing them back in front of the board for feedback. Uh, and then lastly, one of the barriers that we recognized in coordinating with the district early is, is the medium in which applicants are generally required to engage us. So in typical cir circumstances, this has been um, either meetings that we have to schedule in person, a uh, series of phone calls, series of emails, um, and the process has really never been, been seamless or easy, and it's not one that, um, that's been any easier since we've moved to remote or hybrid work. Um, so in order to solve for this, um, staff has built a pre-application track um, into uh, the online application system that, that's fairly easy to use. So um, applicants really just need to click on the track, um, sign up, answer a few questions, drop off their plans, um, meaning attach it to, to the online application system, and then we can screen the, uh, the application and it, for any potential opportunities and then really react accordingly based on that review. Um, so what we're, what we're recommending uh, at this point is that this method of interacting with the district be incorporated into um, the marketing materials that we're going to develop and then um, demonstrated to municipal partners so that they can direct applicants appropriately if they're, they're coming in early to kick the tires, so to speak. So I'm going to just take a breath there um, and uh, just ask if the board is comfortable with the changes that we've outlined so far. Um, is there any risk that we might have missed, or do these generally seem to be in line with the policies that we've discussed? Well, I just, uh, one of the most successful uh, projects we, we, we did uh, through the permitting was the uh, West End. And that, they, you know, they just walked in, and a very sophisticated developer, Duke Development, one of the largest ones in the country, you know, picked up on it right away, and it was great success. Uh, in, Almost with no help at all from the city, uh, that's uh, you're not going to find another Duke uh, in you know the other kind. Uh, you know we had Japs Olson and Methodist, but those were just personal relationships. Uh, the city nearly wasn't in, involved in either one of those. Uh, how how are you going to educate the, the the city staff to? Uh, Look at us as real partners, you know, to get the permits granted, and at the same time, you know, improve the quality of the project. You know, it's, uh, there's no incentive for the city staff guy doing the giving the permit. Sure, and Manager Miller, that's an that's an excellent question and one that we've wrestled with for a really long time. Uh, how do you essentially build trust capital with your city so that they, you can capitalize on opportunities or have them uh, be directed in a certain direction, um, for lack of a better term, you know, when an opportunity is present. Um, and I am going to get to um, how we're structuring municipal agreements and just some of the level of service that we can provide applicants. Um, but to your point, um, for a Duke Realty or anything like that, some of those developers um, actually know that the district has that way of doing business and are coming to us with a very specific ask. And the hope is, is that as we kind of roll this program out, over uh, a longer period of time, that's gonna become more ubiquitous and they'll actually come to us prepared with these things rather than us chasing all of it down. Um, but we're building the infrastructure just in case we do need to uh, chase it down. Could we just table a 
our application the law was the city's application when the summit comes in for a final zoning application i'm sorry manager maxwell did you say that uh, could we could table we staple like a application from the washer district to the city's every city's application for um, Manager Maxwell, that's a great question, and that's essentially what we're doing just through a digital format. So it would be um, arming all of our uh, municipal partners with, you know, the links and the, the direction that we can provide all of the applicants to either engage with us in a, like a pre-application manner um, or just go through the, the regular permit application, you know, if there's not an opportunity present. Yeah, I just think it has to be some kind of piece of paper that they, that's there, because the city staff's not going to say, oh, by the way, here's another one. Sure, and um, like Manager Maxwell, to your point, um, that is one thing that we did consider, um, and uh, not to kind of answer it the same way that I answered Manager Miller's question, but there is a component of that that's going to tie into how we're thinking about municipal partnerships. Um, so I will get to that in just a minute, but I'll, I'll circle back with your question. Thank you. I just keep thinking it's too late. Once they're in for the permit, it's too late. We haven't developed that early relationship. So. <clears throat> Manager Olson, that it's a it's a fair point. Um, generally, if I mean, if it's a municipality and we're like trying to recognize uh, an opportunity at the point of when they're getting a permit, it's far too late. There's been so many gates they could have passed through, yep. um, especially with the in consideration of the criteria that we're establishing with the responsive program. Um, there's really limited opportunity for us to respond there. Um, for for permits, um, there is a component of it that it's always going to be time sensitive. The goal is to set up enough um, methods to encourage people to engage us at the same time, like concept plan, sketch plan, um, that that's associated with city process well in advance of when they get final approvals to, to try and actually suss out whether or not there's an opportunity worth chasing. Is there any other questions at this point? Um, so I will move on to um, defining how we act as a value-added partner. So um, one of the more prominent issues that we've discussed in the past is really just the lack of clarity surrounding how we act as a value-added partner. So collectively, we've really kind of determined that um, we're the most effective as a water resource agency when we're working, um, when we're integrated with land use. And specific to permitting, that, that's recognition that permitting can better add value and achieve its purpose through pursuing partnerships with the land use community. Um, so that purpose and vision makes sense, but the traditional issue has been that there's no established process or framework that has been utilized to guide partnership opportunities. Um, and because of that lack of clarity, there's a lot of ambiguity for staff um, in trying to navigate the process when one doesn't really exist, so we're kind of playing it by ear. Um, for developers um, who are assuming quite a bit of risk when there's nothing to react to, no framework, no process, no guaranteed deliverable, um, and then even uh, the appearance that staff might be operating without the support of the organization because there's no formal materials. Um, and then for the organization too, because there's really um, no way to um, uh, really divide projects one from another. Um, without evaluation criteria, there's always the risk of perceived favoritism. Um, so how we're uh, thinking about that, um, and as Ms. Moran and Ms. Christopher outlined in the previous item, um, we're developing the responsive program with both public and private avenues in mind. Um, and as they, as they both discussed, the, the process that's governing them is largely the same, um, and it's outlined in the, the responsive implementation guidance document uh, that you had in your packet. Um, and that's going to be further clarified in, in upcoming meetings, too, with the internal and external supplemental guidance documents. Um, one of the two of the key differences between um, the public and private avenues. Um, so first, um, it, there, there's a difference in who is the point staff for each. So um, that that really essentially means that permitting staff are going to be responsible for coordinating anything that's discovered through the regulatory process. Um, and then the second por portion is um, the timeline in which they operate under. So by nature, um, private projects function on tighter timelines, and we're trying to anticipate this reality um, by incorporating the additional flexibility that uh, Ms. Moran and Ms. Christopher were, were talking about um, by separating the, the funding process from private projects from the CIP. 
Um, and then as a supplement to this, um, what we're recommending is a modification to the variance and exception rule um, that pays a little bit more deference to, to projects that are specifically designed for natural resource benefits. So as we're moving forward with the responsive program um, with, with, uh, with permitting alignment, um, there's going to be more projects that are identified um, and moved forward with natural resource protection specifically in mind and natural resource improvement. Um, and we want to make sure that our rules are adequately structured in order to permit these projects. So the current structure of our rules really isn't that conducive to these types of projects. Um, they're designed for land use that um, is associated with um, increased density or development. Um, and it's not necessarily uh, equipped to handle a lot of the situations that we find ourselves in when we're proposing a restoration project or something that is specifically designed to benefit natural resources. So what we're recommending is that we'd add additional specificity into the ex exception language that we have um, that would account for these projects and um, they would be specifically uh, designed for the purpose of natural uh, resource improvements. So I realize I'm, I'm moving a little bit fast here, um, but I, I did just want to assess here if the board's comfortable with the changes that we're suggesting, um, if this generally seems to be in line with the strategies and policies that we've discussed. Questions? Would a restoration track include a developer like Lennar that came in and? So, um, Manager Olson, it would really depend on the specific circumstance of what they're proposing. If, if it's going to be a development that also has natural resource benefits, that seems more appropriate for our exception language um, versus um, if, if it's just a project that's aimed at like a wetland restoration, for example. With no other. With no other benefits, our, the rules are a little bit more difficult to move through because there's all sorts of disturbance that you're proposing and the way that other rules are structured, um, there's a lot of gates that you have to pass through. Um, so we're just proposing uh, to, to add some additional language to clarify what we're looking at through the, the variance and exception framework. Okay, um, so that, that takes us to uh, refining the compliance framework. Um, so here, um, we've already outlined a, a few of these issues previously, but just to briefly recap them, um, we have limited measures to discourage non-compliance. Um, we also have limited staff capacity. Um, our inspection and field presence doesn't really have a risk management framework that's guiding it. And then lastly, we don't really have any formal uh, compliance partnerships with our member cities. So we're recommending a few different ways to solve these persistent issues, but I did just want to note um, that the solutions and supporting materials that I'm going to be outlining are really constituent pieces of the larger compliance framework. Um, and before we actually kind of tied all of that together for a draft framework, I just wanted to make sure that the board was comfortable with the foundational pieces. If there's any changes here, that way we can make them here, and um, uh, then we can kind of uh, react accordingly as we're putting together the larger document. Um, so just something to keep in mind uh, as, as I move forward here. Um, so the first issue is um, the limited measures to compel compliance. So um, the district doesn't have the luxury of administrative penalty order. Um, that's unlike our member cities. And we're subject to a bit more of a rigid process when it comes to actually um, addressing noncompliance and compliance issues. Um, but one key difference for us and one issue that's really compounding um, some of our, our enforcement issues um, is that our responses and um, the escalation process that we have that specifically outlines the range of board actions, um, uh, board, uh, the actions that, that the board may take has really been kind of unclear. And it's been something that we've had to dust off basically every single time that we've had a compliance issue come up. Um, so. On top of that, uh, the tools that we do have at our disposal, namely our financial assurances, um, which again are just the sureties that people are submitting for specific rule activity or specific projects, those are out of date. And because they are out of date and uh, not consistent with modern pricing or protocol, um, they're an underutilized tool. Um, so we're proposing to refine both the escalation process for clarity and to update our financial assurance amounts and protocols to make sure that they're a more effective tool. And I'm just going to br very briefly cover how in the next few slides. Um, so in coordination with Smith Partners, uh, we work to outline in graduating levels of enforcement the tools that are available to the district. Um, and this includes um, options that the board has in, in compliance scenarios. So the, the full swath of options ranges all the way from inspection reports 
down to uh, court action supporting previous board orders. So the, that's attachment three in your packet. Um, so if you wanted to look at it in more detail, um, the important point here is that we're going to be taking this understanding and really using it as a primary building block for refining our inspection and compliance protocols. Um, but we just wanted to make sure that the board had eyes on it before we started to build that structure. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, of Mr. Smith, do you have, um, if you have a permit violation, do you have any stop work authority to go to the site and cease what they're working on? Yes, the, the district. Powerful one. Yeah. I don't know if it's listed we're on there, but. Under a time bind here, but uh, nevertheless, uh, if a project is uh, is not uh, suitable for our rules and everything, can we condemn it, make make the improvement, and back charge? Madam President, Manager Miller, um, maybe just to reframe it a bit, if, if a site is out of compliance with our rules, we do have the authority by statute and our rules to um, order the restoration, and if the work is not done in a timely manner, to go on to the site with our own contractor and do the restoration work and then charge it ultimately to the property. Okay, thank you. Um, so for our financial assurance piece, um, the changes that we're um, recommending center around updating to modern pricing. Um, and while I did uh, include the table for all of the revised amounts that, we, that we're proposing, um, I'm not going to go through them in detail uh, because that's not necessarily the most important piece. Um, uh, I think one um, key difference is that we're um, outlining in our protocols that we reassess costs on a three to five year basis making sure that we're keeping our prices current and, and matching modern technology. Um, and then as a supplement to this, um, we're going to be outlining clear guidance in the compliance framework on how and when financial assurances can be drawn upon to compel compliance in a variety of different scenarios. So in the past, we've really only used this when there was a problem after construction was completed. Um, we're going to be looking toward outlining steps and process to draw on them um, during active construction should issues arise. Um, just as an added deterrent to non-compliance and incorporate that into the escalation um, and compliance framework that we're going to be developing. Um, so this will, again, be packaged for the board and be in front of you before we go external to the TAC. Um, so the, the issues of limited staff capacity and uh, the lack of a risk, risk management framework, those, those are really linked items. Um, and it's really because that we don't have a defined risk framework, um, our inspections are treated more in, in kind of an egalitarian matter. And because of that, there isn't really clear priorities for staff. And as a result, our, our time is a little bit strained. So to solve this, um, we're recommending the development of a formal prioritization uh, framework. Um, and again, I'm going to go through this fairly quickly, but to very briefly describe um, how we thought about uh, site prioritization, we really broke it down into uh, two main components, um, the project type or construction method, um, and then the site prioritization criteria. So there's inherent risk that we, that we assign to specific project types. Um, and then for the second piece, the site prioritization criteria, those are just kind of the um, characteristics of a given site. Um, or a more qualitative assessment of compliance history that might influence uh, a certain site to be a higher priority than, than another. So that would ultimately lead us to number three, which is a recommended inspection frequency based on uh, numbers one and two. Um, so the, uh, the projects and construction methods um, that, we, that we looked at, it was, it was a Stantec exercise that really outlined how invasive construction practices might be the likelihood of impacts, the number of resources that are typically affected, and then the size and scale at which um, some of these are occurring. So the, these really range from large-scale subdivisions um, at the top of our, our risk assessment all the way down to shoreline uh, stabilizations at the bottom. So I'm not going to go through each of these or their justification. Um, those that have been incorporated into the packet and are available on page 29 if you'd like a little bit more detail or would like to look at the justification. Um, but on top of the, um, the project type, um, we're looking also at the site criteria, as, as I kind of just mentioned. Um, and then we're judging how much risk a, a site actually um, site poses. 
Um, so it really doesn't box us into anything that's overly rigid, but it really serves as a helpful guide um, in sorting through the district's inspection and field presence priorities. Um, so ultimately, um, what we're left with is then a ranking from very high to very low. And then this dictates how, how frequently inspections should be occurring. So just as an example, if something is ranked high, um, we're recommending that it be inspected at the start of construction, monthly after that, at any point when um, the construction activity or the stage of construction changes, um, when any complaints are received, and then when construction is completed. Um, so again, uh, there's more detail on this in the packet if, you, if you'd like to explore it, um, but essentially what we're proposing with these, um, these component pieces is to um, really uh, formulate a baseline to build the remainder of the compliance framework around so this will be combined in conjunction with the updated financial assurance protocols, the amounts, and then the escalation framework that we just outlined a few moments ago. Um, so the last piece that we're going to be talking about um, is um, the uh, formally established compliance um, partnerships. So we currently don't have any, um, and we don't have any um, formal um, arrangements for joint enforcement. Because of this, we're often left to resolve issues independently, um, and this is even um, even in consideration that um, oftentimes cities in the watershed district are looking at uh, the exact same requirements. Um, so coupled with our limited range of enforcement tools, um, this is really kind of putting us at a disadvantage when we could be cooperatively compelling compliance and resolving issues a lot faster. So to address this, what we're recommending um, is developing municipal partners through, partnerships through formal agreements. Um, so I, I did want to apologize, first of all. I know there's a lot of text on this, this slide, but I wanted to condense a little bit um, uh, attachment four in the packet, um, just the principles and rationale behind how we're thinking about structuring some of these formal agreements with our member cities. Um, so, in abbreviated terms, the, the logic chain is basically that the district is governed by uh, watershed law, and that requires us to regulate a number of different topics. Um, there's also uh, state and local agencies that have regulations that are related, um, and that uh, those regulations, um, our member cities are subject to those, uh, to those uh, regulations and those requirements. Um, at the same time, uh, the district is already undertaking many of these responsibilities as part of its normal regulatory programming and can serve as subject matter experts assisting its cities with meeting some of these uh, other permit requirements um, or other requirements. Um, and then through developing formal relationships through agreements, we can build trust capital that may facilitate um, future project partnerships. And then kind of underpinning all of this, um, it still preserves the city and the district's authority um, and we can retain our authorities while simultaneously establishing um, a joint uh, protocols for how we can compel compliance together. So um, from these, these principles, we essentially developed a menu, um, so to speak, of collaboration options for our cities to react to. Um, off the cuff, what we're, we're kind of thinking is that erosion control and stormwater management are going to be the two primary vehicles um, that we anticipate the majority of these partnerships being developed from. Um, and again, this is largely due to the MS4 requirements that have just recently come out. Um, and again, the MS4 uh, permit is something that the MPCA governs, uh, and really it outlines requirements that all cities in the watershed district uh, are subject to, um, which include site inspections, um, site disturbance management, stormwater management requirements, and plan review protocols and reporting. So, um, excuse me. Um, the idea is really to utilize the district's technical expertise to, to assess issues, make recommendations, um, and then outline jointly how um, that reporting will be routed to cities and will be handled internally, um, and then how we can look towards uh, joint enforcement proceedings um, if, if there's an issue that arises. Um, so in that way, we're kind of the technical ex experts um, and the boots on the ground. Um, so we can ensure that each agency's authority is preserved, um, and then with the development of these agreements and the exchange of services, these scenarios really provide us in, with an opportunity to incorporate permitting integration into the, the planning and zoning process like we discussed earlier. So in a way, it serves as a springboard to sync up the district and its member cities. Um, so the goal would be to more or less use template agreements with our member cities, um, and since we 
and that would be primarily to limit the negotiation from city to city. Um, but since every uh, city is subject to MS4, um, FEMA model ordinances, uh, the Wetland Conservation Act, planning and zoning laws, we're not anticipating that these agreements are going to vary um, much from city to city. And again, this is depending on tax feedback. So I, I know that was quite quick and quite a bit of information, um, but I'll stop here to just assess whether or not the board is comfortable with the changes that we've <laughs> um, that we've outlined, if there's any risk associated with uh, any of the suggestions that we have that we might have missed, or if this generally seems in line um, with the policy shifts that we propose. Propose. Where did the numbers come from in the um, surety amount changes? Um, so. Uh, President White, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we had Stantec do an analysis um, that looked at multiple different watershed districts um, and then um, construction pricing. And uh, I, I believe it was pricing both in the metro and then nationally um, for, for costing. Uh, and that was specific to stormwater. Um, erosion control was just more um, based on modern grading prices, if I recall correctly. Thank you. And you spoke of using that as a tool, using the higher amount. Correct. Um, so what we were uh, really kind of anticipating there is utilizing financial assurances as a stronger deterrent. Just the way that they're structured now, um, the costs are lower. Um, and there might be scenarios where people are okay with walking away from $1,500 um, if, that's, if that's the amount that's, that's required. Um, I think one of the things that we found through the process was that the way that we had the stormwater um, uh, component structured in particular significantly undervalued the amount of um, money that's required to incorporate a certain amount of storage on a site. So now it's based more on um, the amount of impervious surface that you have to treat rather than just a volume of storage that you're proposing. Thank you. Tom, do we always collect the cash or do we have... Uh, what is a credit is acceptable? Um, there is, there's multiple, um, uh, uh, there's multiple different financial assurance um, methods that we can employ. There's bonds, uh, letters of credit, and then uh, sureties and escrows. Um, the, the cash sureties are by far the most common. Have we returned them all for people who never had to burden their pile? For a while there, we were discussing about a pretty substantial number that that's a great question, uh, Manager Olson. So um, there has been uh, kind of a lapse in people requesting funding back, and that has a lot to do with, A, the amounts not being very high, um, and people forget about it. Um, but then the second component is um, a lot of the companies that we were uh, talking about with the, um, the last time this was in front of the board, which I think was maybe a month ago, uh, if not a little bit more, um, a lot of those companies were pre-2008, and a lot of them went bankrupt and or are out of business. So those are now, they haven't claimed it because the business doesn't exist anymore. Thank you. And, of course, what you talked about was having the older sureties be tracked down and taken care of in a proper way. That's correct. Okay. Anything else? Great. Sounds good, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deacher. Um, Very thorough. Uh, I'll just briefly cover the next steps, and I'm. This is at risk of well, repeating. We were saying it because we thought you were done. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm just going to end now. There, there goes the next good steps. Huh. I withdraw but, that previous statement. <laughs> consider it struck it from the record. Struck from the record. Um, so the next steps are very similar to what Ms. Moran and Ms. Christopher outlined. Um, so we're going to be incorporating the board's feedback, refining the materials in advance of the TAC meeting um, in tandem with the responsive program, and then um, looking for board authorization for the TAC process in September. We still like that report. Yeah. Okay, all right, fine. <laughs> Thank you very much.